No matter how intense or strong your spiritual bondage is, you can be free. No matter how many times you've attempted to be free, you can be free. Even if you've been freed before, only to come back into spiritual bondage, you can be freed, and this time, the cycle can be broken. Permanent freedom is God's will for your life. God did not create you to live in anxiety, to live with depression, to live with torment of the mind, to live in confusion or in distraction, to live in aimlessness. God called you to walk in perfect victory. The life of the believer is meant to be one of spiritual victory. We fall for these myths, these ideas that tell us that we must go from deliverance to deliverance to deliverance for the rest of our lives. But God did not call you to go from deliverance to deliverance. He called you to go from glory to glory. He created you to walk in dominion, power, and authority. And dominion, power, and authority is the way of the life of the believer. You don't have to settle for anything less than perfect liberty permanently. Now, that drawing you sense is of the Spirit. God brought you to this teaching right here, right now, for such a time as this. And though you are drawn to this by the Holy Spirit, if you'll notice, there may be another side that's drawing you away. I am not here to entertain you. I'm here to edify you. I'm here to serve you the Word of God and truths that will liberate you for the rest of your life. And I want to give you those truths, but here's the problem. The flesh is going to fight you. You're going to want to click on things that maybe are entertaining but won't do anything for your spirit. So I want you to say yes to the Holy Spirit and no to the flesh. I challenge you to watch this teaching from start to finish. And you'll sense again that pulling. Your flesh will squirm and fight you. Why? Because the flesh is being defeated as the truths are going forth. And so I want you right now to determine in your heart, to determine in your mind, that enough is enough. It's time to step in to permanent victory. That's what God has called you to. And I want you to write that in the comment section, right? Enough is enough. Let that be a bold and public declaration, letting the enemy know that you are done with his games. You are done with falling for his deception. You know, that's the only power he can have over you. The only power that the enemy can have over you is the power that he deceives you into giving to him. Your belief in his power, your exaggeration of his power, your obsession with his power is part of why he's able to keep you in spiritual bond. And I'm going to show you just how deceptive the enemy is. And I'm going to show you how to come into the truth that will liberate you. In John chapter 8, verse 36, the scripture tells us, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's completely and permanently. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 tells us, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It's time to be done with the cycle once and for all. No, it is not a normal part of the Christian life to live under the power of demonic attack. No, it is not a part of the Christian life to go from victory to defeat, victory to defeat. Now, just to be clear, I'm not talking about trials, temptations, and tragedies. We will all face hardship in this life. That's part of the Christian life. God never promised that he would give us perfectly ideal situations in which we will live. God did promise that no matter what we faced on the outside, that we would always have victory internally. So let me show you why many believers are still bound. Many believers are still bound because they never get to the root of their problems. For the believer, spiritual warfare is simply the fight to believe God's truth over the enemy's lies. If you are a born-again Christian filled with the Holy Spirit, then I want to make it clear to you that the only power the enemy can have over you is the power of deception. Deception produces many different results. Deception can produce addiction. Deception can produce depression. Deception can produce fear and anxiety and even torment of the mind. And because we fall for his lies, we live under the power of that lie. The enemy only has the power to deceive you and nothing more. And I'm going to show you that from scripture. But first, let's take a look at the nature of this deception. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. By the way, make sure you've shared this because we want to make sure we're spreading these wonderful truths that will help people to be liberated permanently so. Again, 
You apply this, it's not going to be a temporary deliverance. It will be permanent. Why? Because you're getting to the actual root and you're addressing the actual problem. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Now, for context, these two verses are Paul's defense of his apostolic authority. In other words, there were these individuals who were trying to challenge the apostolic authority of Paul. Perhaps they were jealous. Perhaps they were just trying to build their own thing. For whatever reason, they began to publicly challenge the apostolic authority of Paul the Apostle. And so his response is to call their arguments, their deceptions, their slander, their gossip. He refers to those arguments, to those reasonings as strongholds. Context considered, the spiritual takeaway principle that has general application is simply this. Thought patterns, deceptive ones that is, can be like strongholds. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a fortified place, like a fortress or a wall. Anything that is well established for the purpose of defense in terms of uh, military application is a stronghold. And so Paul the Apostle likens deception or slander or gossip or reasonings that are based upon that deception, he likens these mindsets to strongholds. So clearly here, Paul is talking about the spiritual nature of a mindset, and he's comparing that mindset to a stronghold. So a stronghold, biblically speaking, is any thought or mindset that contradicts the truth. Now, let's break this portion of Scripture down here. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5, we'll break it down, our weapons are not carnal. In other words, we don't wage war by physical means. We're engaged in a spiritual battle. And for the believer, that spiritual battle hinges upon one simple fight, and that is the fight for truth. Why? Because if the enemy can get you to believe a lie, then you are deceived. You see, a lie is only a contradiction of the truth. A lie does not become deception until you believe it. If you reject the lie, it's just a lie. But if you accept that lie and you begin to believe that lie, now you're under the power of deception, which again is the primary attack of the enemy against believers. Deception produces thoughts and feelings. You begin to think and feel according to that deception. Watch this now. Then those thoughts and feelings become consistent actions or habits. Those habits become life cycles, and those cycles are what we refer to as spiritual bondage. So let's break it down again. Deception becomes a thought pattern. That thought pattern becomes a behavior pattern. That behavior pattern becomes a lifestyle. That lifestyle is what we call spiritual bondage. The problem is that many believers want to address the symptoms, but never the source. They want to address the results, but never the root. And so they're left trying to combat the depression itself, the fear itself, the sin itself, the torment itself, the addiction itself. And of course, you should address those things directly. But while you're also addressing those things directly, you have to ask yourself, how did any of those things gain influence in my life in the first place? And this, of course, comes back to deception. Now, next we see the scripture tells us that the weapons we have are mighty through God, or in other words, they're effective for the cause of God. They're effective unto their purpose, which is the expansion of the kingdom of heaven within the mind. To the pooling down of strongholds. I love the way that the scripture describes this reality. This is talking about the fact that the strongholds are completely dismantled. To get an idea of what the Greek is implying here, simply picture a brick wall. Now, if you were to pull down that brick wall in the same sense that's being described here in the Greek, then that would mean that not one brick would be left upon the other. In other words, the utter destruction of the stronghold, not a partial destruction, not just a little piece here or there. What's being implied is that the stronghold is being completely wiped away to where you don't even have to lift your foot to step over it. It's not even an inch off the ground. It's completely gone. When stepping into your victory after destroying a stronghold in this way, you don't even have to worry about getting rubble in your shoe. It's complete 
and utter destruction, the absolute and complete removal of the stronghold. And this is where Christians are called to live. Now, stopping here for just a moment, because I think we've come to develop mindsets based upon poor interpretations of Scripture and bad doctrine. But you as a believer are not called to live in spiritual bondage. Now, I know I've said this before, and some people think possibly that I'm being insensitive to the suffering of individuals. But the reality is that it's not insensitive to tell someone the truth. In fact, by telling you the truth, there's hope in that. I'm giving you hope from the Scripture that gives you a standard to which you are to aspire. In other words, you don't have to settle for living in spiritual bondage. And some, some Christians, sadly, begin to develop even somewhat of an ego around their spiritual battles. They say things like, oh, well, the enemy is attacking me so much because he knows how much of a threat I am to his kingdom. The question being, if the enemy is threatened by you, wouldn't he want to get as far away from you as possible rather than stir the nest? So if the enemy was afraid of us, he wouldn't attack us at all because he would be afraid of that retaliation. So we start to develop this ego around it. Well, I, I'm the one who struggles. I'm the one who suffers. I'm the one who's engaged with the enemy constantly in that battle. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that Christians are not engaged in spiritual battle. What I am saying is that even though we battle, we cannot confuse a battle for a bondage. We cannot confuse defense for defeat. Just because we have to be aware of the enemy doesn't mean that we have to be paranoid about the enemy. We come against the enemy from the place of victory, from the place of authority. Many believers picture themselves in the spiritual battle, holding up their shield of faith, just hiding under there saying, Lord, get me out of here. I'm in a spiritual battle. And that may be the state of the believer at that time. But that's not the state to which God has called you to live. He's called you to be mighty through God, using the weapons that are not carnal to utterly destroy and dismantle the influence of the enemy in your life. Now watch this, casting down imaginations. What are imaginations? Reasonings, deceptive paradigms, mindsets, ideas. These deceptions are the imaginations that keep the believer bound. And so we cast these imaginations down using God's mighty power using God's mighty weapons. Now watch this. The Bible goes on to say every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now this can either be the truth about God or what we know in God. Bringing into captivity every thought. I love this thought right here. We bring into captivity every thought. When a stronghold is taken, so are the prisoners. See, many believers try to take control over their thoughts without ever addressing the stronghold, which is a thought pattern. But you can't take the captives until you've taken the stronghold. So instead of just trying to address every single stray thought, you have to find the stronghold in which those deceptive thoughts hide. Again, a lie is anything that contradicts the truth, and a lie, once you believe it, becomes deception. That deception becomes a mindset through which we think, of course, and also act. Those thoughts and actions become habits. Those habits become life cycles. And again, those life cycles are what we refer to as spiritual bondage. Many believers, when they picture spiritual bondage, they literally picture a demon on their shoulder or in their body. But we know that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We understand through scripture that demons cannot inhabit the believer or even attach to them. But that doesn't mean that believers can't be affected by demonic power. Demons affect believers and attack believers from the outside. Just as an earthly enemy can taunt you from the outside or attack you from the outside or torment you from the outside or accuse you from the outside or lie to you from the outside, so demons also do the same. And so if we're not careful, we begin to fight battles that are not necessarily fought in the right way. And we start to address things, again, based upon misconceptions, preconceived ideas, and misinterpretation of Scripture. And this is why we wonder, why am I always stuck? Why do I have to keep going back to get free? Well, I'm telling you, because you're not addressing the deceptive lie at the root of every attack. And so, how do you do this? I'll show you in a moment. Most believers try to address the habit itself and not the deception behind it. And that, of course, is what leads to this perpetual bondage. This is why believers get, they get frustrated because they're saying, why is it that I can't seem to break this? Or why is it that I was able to break it, but it seems to come back every time? I'm just going to be vulnerable here for a moment and tell you 
But there was a time in my life where I, I had severe anxiety. My wife could tell you, my friends could tell you, Steve could tell you. It was a severe and heavy battle. Now, I had battled anxiety and depression since I was seven years old. People often assume that I've not had any real encounters with demonic beings because of the way I teach about them. But the truth of the matter is that I actually come from a family of witches and warlocks. My great-great-grandfather was a witch doctor who practiced in Zacatecas, Mexico, and people would come from all over the region to have him place curses on individuals and even heal the sick, even though he wasn't operating in Holy Spirit power, he was operating in demonic power. Nevertheless, these demonic powers that attacked our family generationally, you notice I said generational attack. Generational attacks are simply the enemy strategizing against you based upon your genetics and your family history. In other words, the enemy figures, if this attack worked on the father, surely it will work on the son. Why? Because they're similar in nature. And so in my family, we were attacked by demonic beings generationally. That's how demons work. They strategize. Now, this is not to be confused with what some would call a curse. I don't use that term generational curse because the word curse implies that we bear no responsibility for the results of that attack. You only bear the fruits of demonic deception when you give way to it. You have the choice to live in victory. You have the choice to walk in power. And so my family got saved. This breaks the attack. But I myself still struggled with certain things because I wasn't necessarily a born-again believer at that time. And seven years old and onward, I battled anxiety, depression. Let me tell you something. I don't often talk about this. I saw demonic faces in the wall in my room. I saw demonic faces looking back at me. I literally heard demonic voices. I literally conversed on two occasions with demonic beings face to face. I'm not proud of that. I'm not bragging about that. I'm sharing about this so that you know how severe this was. And in knowing how severe this was, you can have hope to know that you can be set free too. Now, I don't think that it had come all the way to the point of, of possession, but there was certainly a battle over my life. I could sense the war in the heavenlies, if you will, light against darkness. And this was a battle for my soul. And since seven years old, I remember having this cloud of depression, this, this angst of anxiety within me. And so I was saved at 11 years old. That power was broken. And then even though I was set free from the demonic aspect of that stronghold, the deceptive thought pattern remained. I never dealt with the lie that caused me to be anxious. And so there was a, uh, I, I want to say a string of time or a certain period of time in my life where anxiety wasn't even an issue for me. And it went on for years where I walked in this perfect liberty and lo and behold, Late into my, I want to say, late into my teen years, probably around my early 20s, this anxiety slowly started to creep back in. There wasn't any one single moment where I can point to and say, that's where the anxiety returned. But it got so bad, eventually, that I was regularly having panic attacks. I had to schedule my day around when I usually had panic attacks. That's how severe it was. I couldn't enjoy a meal with my wife. I couldn't enjoy time with friends. I couldn't drive a car without worrying about what if I have a panic attack while I'm driving. It was so bad that there were times that I thought I was going to die. My physical body would react to the fear. I would get tunnel vision. My heart would race so hard that I would feel the pulse in my neck. Uh, my hands would sweat. I would feel pain on the left side of my body. I would grow weak. I would shake. And I was filled with this sense of doom, like something really, really bad was certainly going to happen in any second. And so I battled with this for years. And it wasn't until I discovered the root of this lie. And by the way, I tried everything. I went to all the conferences. I went to the deliverance sessions. I went to the revival meetings, the worship meetings, uh, the counseling sessions, you name it. And some of those things would work for a period of time. And I'm not saying they're necessarily wrong. But for me, I'm just being honest, it didn't work. And maybe that's where you find yourself. You find it always comes back somehow, some way. Well, I can report to you now that I'm living in perfect peace, that anxiety has not returned, the Holy Spirit has given me victory over this, and it's like something in my rearview mirror, that panic, that type of angst living in that. Now, I can sense the enemy trying to invite me back into that place or tempt me to go back there. I can, I can sense the lies that he tries to throw my way to bring me back to that place, but I refuse to go back there. Why? Because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. 
and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So what was the issue for me? Well, I found that I was believing a lie, and the lie was simply this. And maybe it's the same for you, maybe it's a different lie. The lie was simply this. I believed that God was angry with me, and I believed that God wanted to do me harm. Now, I would never say that out loud, and I didn't think that intellectually, right? Like, at the forefront of my mind, I knew what the Scripture says. Yet, I didn't allow the truth of God's love to fully immerse me. I didn't allow the implications of those truths to actually manifest in my life. I knew it intellectually, but I did not experience the truth of that until the Holy Spirit revealed it to me. So, If you want to be free from the stronghold once and for all, what you have to do is expose that lie. I'm going to show you how to do that in a moment. That's why the old saying goes, the devil exposed is a devil defeated. Jesus said, listen to this now. Jesus said, you'll know the truth. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, that means if you're still bound, then there's a truth that you've not fully embraced. If you're still bound, there's a lie somewhere deep down that you believe about yourself, about God, about the world, about the scripture. If you are bound, you are deceived. All spiritual bondage is rooted in spiritual deception. And that's a fact. I'm going to show you that in scripture in a moment. But first, I want to show you how to expose the lie, and I'm going to show you how to defeat it. So strongholds are mindsets, reasonings that are based on deception. Those mindsets and reasonings produce thoughts and actions. Those thoughts and actions produce habits. Those habits become cycles, and those cycles are what we refer to as spiritual bondage. Again, for the believer, the believer cannot be inhabited by demons. The believer cannot have demons attached to them. Now, I believe in exorcism, but that's a whole different uh, lesson for a whole different time. You could check out a bunch of teachings I have on the channel. I know there's probably a lot of questions that come up when I say something like this, like, Well, then who is deliverance for? Or didn't Peter have a demon? And so forth. All of those, there's answers for that, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. I want to just talk to you about you as a believer experiencing total freedom. And so knowing that the enemy's only power over you is deception, though it may not feel like that at times, is the first step to liberty. See, some Christians, I'm going to say it, and you may not like it, but I love you, so I'm going to tell you anyway. Some Christians just can't let go of certain ideas because of the traditions of man, and that's the power of religion. Because our ego wants us to hold on to what we've been told. Our ego wants to embrace and and double down on something that we've always believed. And this is why it's interesting to me that usually those who believe those traditional thoughts are the ones that are always bound. It's the ones who've come to know the truth that are absolutely free. Now, again... I'm going to say this, but, but, but it's because I love you. Some of you are arguing against your deliverance and you don't even know it. No, really. You're arguing against your deliverance and you don't even know it. I've talked to so many believers who've come to me. They say, David, I want to be free. I said, here's what you need to do to be free. And they say, well, no, I thought it was this. I said, well, it's not working, is it? Ask yourself, is it working for me? Or do I have to keep repeating this again and again and again? Why? Why doesn't my life look like what they saw in the book of Acts? Why why am I not walking in that perfect liberty? Why does it seem like my spiritual life is always hanging by a thread? Because you're arguing against your deliverance. Because you don't realize that the enemy loves to exaggerate his power. The enemy loves to exaggerate his power. He wants you to think he owns you. He wants you to think he controls you. He wants you to think he can inhabit you. He wants you to think his minions can attach themselves to you. He wants you to think that he has more power over you than he actually does. And I find that Christians, when they're liberated from this idea, actually walk in perfect freedom. Instead of going down a rabbit hole that takes them from torment to torment to torment, where they become hyper paranoid, hyper aware of everything that they think is demonic when it's not. They see a demon in everything dangerous. Why? Because it takes the focus off the Holy Spirit's power. Now, I say this to you as someone who practices deliverance, who practices exorcism, who believes deliverance is for today, 
who believes that we need to be casting devils out of people as Christians today. Every believer should be doing that. I'm not saying this as some cessationist. I practice this. You'll see it in our meetings. You see it on our live streams. You see it through this ministry. We have thousands of testimonies. But I'm saying this to you. You've got to come out of the power of religion. You've got to come out of the power of tradition. And that first step is embracing this truth that the enemy's only power over you is deception. It may not feel that way. There may be illusions and hallucinations, maybe dreams, nightmares, different manifestations of his power that are aimed at deceiving you into thinking he has more power over you. But where does that leave you? Jesus plus what? If the Holy Spirit's power isn't working, you have to ask yourself, are you truly using the Holy Spirit's power? If the way you're walking in the Spirit isn't working, you have to ask yourself, am I really walking in the Spirit? You see, demons cannot swim in the depths of God. We need to learn to do spiritual warfare from higher places, from seats of authority, from places of glory. Holy Spirit-focused, not demon-focused. And when you're Holy Spirit-focused, you're aware of the demonic attacks. The Bible does tell us to watch out. The enemy prowls about like a roaring lion, so we're not going to be blind or ignorant. We're not going to be apathetic toward the attacks of the enemy. But we come at this from a place of authority. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Well, there's no power. There's no power on this earth. There's no power below this earth that's stronger than the power that lives in you. So you must embrace this reality. The enemy's only power over you is deception. And if you don't come to that truth, you're just going to get stuck in cycles. I'm just telling you like it is. I love you. I'm just telling you like it is. If you don't come to that truth, you will always be going from cycle to cycle. Maybe freedom for a few weeks. Maybe freedom for a few months. I've known of people who've experienced freedom for a couple years. But they never addressed the root, which was deception. And because of that, they're stuck. They're frustrated. So you have to come to this reality first. The enemy's only power over you is deception. And so once you recognize that, now you have a tactic. Okay, how do I go about this? And again, I'll show you that in Scripture right now, that the enemy's power over you is deception. But first, I want to show you how to expose those lies. Number one, you want to now expose the lies. You say, okay, I accept that. My spiritual bondage is rooted in a lie. Okay, now you have to ask yourself, how do I expose those lies? Number one, we know the truth by God's word. You have to know the truth. Once you know the truth, then you can begin to live in it. Breakthrough comes when I know the truth. It's like an aha moment, a spiritual epiphany, if you will. Breakthrough comes when I know the truth. But freedom comes when I walk in that truth. So once you realize the truth, it's like, oh, that's a breakthrough. Now, you're not quite there yet, but there's an epiphany, you know, a realization. Your eyes are open. Oh, my goodness, there's the enemy. But only when you begin to walk in that truth do you then experience the freedom that comes from that truth. For me, again, I'd always known, like intellectually, God loves me. He's for me. But deep down in my heart, because of my past with legalism and religion, I truly believed that God was angry, God was ready to punish me, that God, I, 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 can't, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, but part of me believed God hated me. And that's just what I thought. But then I realized, no, that's the remnant of a legalistic mindset. That's the remnant of religious thinking, to view yourself as just a worm before God. Yes, we understand he's great. Yes, we understand we don't deserve his grace. Yes, we understand that we're nothing without him. But once I come into Christ... Once I become a new creation, I'm no longer a sinner. I'm a saint. That's my old nature. I don't even identify with that anymore. So now I become a new creation. And once I become a new creation, I learn my identity. And once I learn my identity, I recognize certain lies. And so that's what I thought. I thought God was angry with me. I thought God wanted to punish me. And I realized, here's what was so amazing. I looked back in my life, and in fact, the Holy Spirit had to take me like on a journey through the timeline of my life at one instant. The Holy Spirit began to show me that same lie, that fear, manifested over and over and over at every phase of my life. From when I was in kindergarten and I was afraid to go to school, to when we would go on family vacation and I was afraid to ride in the car, to when we would go to theme parks when I was a kid and I was afraid that I was going to die at the theme park. I, I kid you not, these were things that would happen to me. 
to seeing the demonic faces in the wall, to worrying about whether or not I'd be a good husband, to worrying about whether or not I'd be a good father, to worrying about whether or not I'd fail in ministry, all those lies again and again and again, over and over and over again, were all based on one deception, one deception, which was God is angry with me and he intends to harm me. And once I realized that, okay, now I had a reference from which I could work, but I had to actually work that truth into my life. So I'm going to show you how to expose it. We're getting deep today. We're going to expose the enemy today. And I pray this is setting you free. If it is, make sure you're subscribed to this channel. I post teachings on the Holy Spirit prayer and spiritual warfare. So we, we know the truth by God's word. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So first you must know the word. Don't tell me, and I know this is going to offend someone, but again, I love you, so I'm telling you the truth. Don't tell me you're desperate for freedom and you don't even read the word every day. Don't tell me you're doing everything you can to be free and you're not even having an intake of scripture on a daily basis. You would be amazed at how many of your issues would cease to be issues if you simply read your scriptures every day. A lot of spiritual bondage is the result of spiritual immaturity. Believers who say, I don't want to take responsibility for my spiritual growth. You just lay hands on me and make it all happen for me. No, my friend, that's not how this works. Yes, when we're saved, born again, we're delivered from demonic power. But you still have to enact discipline to be delivered from self as a believer. And so we know the truth by God's word. If you just practice the spiritual basics, you will avoid spiritual crisis. Anyone who's ever messaged me on Instagram, Facebook, email, or if they're able to text me, they'll say, hey, this is what I'm going through. I'm in a spiritual bondage. I always ask them this question. How is your prayer life? How is your devotion to the word? 99.99999% of the time, when I'm talking to someone who's in spiritual bondage, 99.99999% of the time, they're not in the word every day. They're not in prayer. They're not walking in a devotion to the Holy Spirit's power. And they, they admit this, and it's good that we admit it because that's part of humility. It's part of finding freedom. They admit this, and I have to tell them, well, why don't you go try that and then come back and see how you're doing? Most of the time, once they implement that, problem solved. Suddenly, they're walking in victory. Suddenly, they see who they are in Christ. If you believe that a demon can inhabit you or attach itself to you, you don't understand the power of the Holy Spirit. It's an, in, it's an insult to the power of the Holy Spirit. And I can think of few lies as destructively powerful as the lie that Christians can have demons in them or attached to them. I, the enemy, here's how subtle the enemy is. And many believers will say, well, I was delivered from a demon. No, you were probably delivered from the belief that you had a demon. Now I'm getting some, I, I know we're going there, but, but I have to tell you the truth. I have to tell you the truth. Why? Because I love you and I love the word. If you believe as a born-again believer that you can have a demon in you or attached to you, you do not understand the power of the Holy Ghost. You got to go deeper. You got to go deeper. You got to go deeper in the Word. You got to go deeper in the Spirit. You got to come to a greater understanding of who you are in Christ, what salvation even is. And so you come to this place by knowing the Word. You come to this place by basing your life upon the Scriptures. Once you begin to devote yourself to the Lord in that way, once you begin to understand what the scripture says, suddenly the lies start to appear. The word of God is that light that begins to shine. And as that light begins to shine, the darkness dissipates. If you are bound, you have to find that line. And if you're not devoted to the word and prayer, my goodness, you're not even doing the basics. And so if you're not even doing the basics, you have to at least start there. I know this is tough but I'm, I'm tough on you because I love you. And, and, I, and I'll tell you this, if you will humble yourself and embrace the truth, you'll find liberty. Number two, we know the truth by the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says this, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything 
and will remind you of everything I have told you. Now, the Holy Spirit will teach you the truth. Once you begin to become familiar with the truth, the Holy Spirit can now remind you of that truth. But if you're not in the Word, what's He going to remind you of? If you're not in the Word, what's He going to teach you? The Holy Spirit uses the Word to reveal the truth. And now that you're getting truth into your life, watch this now, the truth compared to the lie, you start to realize, wait a minute, this is the lie. And you toss it out. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment. So you know the truth by the Word. You know the truth by the Holy Spirit. You know the truth by sound teachers, people of God. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says this, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So we learn the truth of the Word of God from sound teachers. And as we begin to receive truth, the lies automatically reveal themselves. Why? Because now I'm becoming more familiar with the truth, and the enemy can't bully me. You realize that the enemy is just like a bully. The moment you stand up to him with the word, he flees. Resist the devil and he will flee. That's simple. You resist him. How? How did Jesus do it? I'm going to give you truth right now. I need you to hear this because this will liberate you. Resist the devil and he will flee. Well, how do you resist the devil? Well, how did Jesus resist the devil? It is written. He would claim a truth or declare a truth that contradicted a lie or an angle that the enemy was presenting. In the moment you know that word, suddenly you're armed against the enemy. And now you begin to use the word, speaking against those lies. So, the battle for truth, this is what it's all about. I'll say it again so that you, you, you get this in your mind, because we have to know, we have to know the truth. When demons attack Christians, it's always by way of deception. The way that demons, of course, can physically harm the believer is either through a sickness, as we've seen in Scripture, or by using a demonically influenced person to attack you physically. But in order to attack you physically, a demon has to use something that is in the fallen state that exists physically in this world. Um, but other than that, they can't do anything against your physical body because it's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, a sickness is not a demon. Demons can use sickness to attack people, but the sickness itself is not a demon. Scripture makes a clear uh, delineation between the two. So watch this now. Go to Ephesians 6. So you know the truth. Okay, once I know the truth, how do I fight that deception? Well, watch this. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to show you. Let's go verses 10 onward, and, and I'll, I'll stop when, when, I, when I feel that the point has been made. Watch this verse 10. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. First of all, that's a command. You be strong. You do something to be strong. How? Verse 11, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Wait a minute here. You put on. That's a command. So we as believers must take responsibility for parts of our spiritual growth. Of course, sanctification, that's a work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, being a work in progress implies that the Father is working on you, of course. He gives us the grace to resist sin, of course. He fuels our faith, gives us a desire for the word, desire for prayer, desire for holiness, boldness in evangelism, and so forth. Yes, God does do a work in your life, but there are certain aspects of your spiritual growth that God has called you to implement as a result of the exercise of your free will. Here, verse 11 is very clearly telling us, you put on God's armor, you do it. Put it on so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Now, who is this written to? It's written to believers. Okay, watch this now. I'm going to show you something. Remember that I told you that the enemy's only attack against the believer is deception? Well, look here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. And there we see that the Bible tells us that if we put on God's armor that we are therefore standing firm against all the attacks of the enemy. Okay, the moment you were saved, you were delivered from demonic power. You say, where is that in the Bible? I'll show you. For, or it's Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Now let's go to verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Whoa, this is powerful. You are a saint in the light not a sinner in the darkness. Watch this, verse 13. Who hath, that's past tense, 
who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Wow. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have currently, now we possess through his blood, redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, when you were born again, you were delivered from demonic attachments and demonic habitation, the demonic kingdom. In fact, the scripture talks about the fact that when you become a new creation, all things become new. That term, all things, when you study the context, is a reference to everything that has to do with your old life, including any attachments that you may have. So you come into this new identity, or you're a new creation. The Holy Spirit fills you, not just your body. He fills the soul and the spirit. He permeates your being, your being of light, your heavenly being. Now, as a new creation, you are no longer bound by demonic power. But this doesn't mean that demons don't attack you. Well, the devil tried to tempt Jesus, and Jesus was perfect. But temptation doesn't mean you're bound. Torment doesn't mean that you're bound. Paul the Apostle wrote very clearly about the fact that he was tormented by a messenger of Satan. Yet he was a born-again believer, so you can be attacked and even tormented. Some say, well, it was a thorn in his flesh. Well, that was the analogy that described the literal reality. Thorn in the flesh is one phrase. If you think Paul was talking about his literal flesh, then you also have to commit to believing that Paul was talking about a literal thorn, which in the Greek means a wooden stake. So none of us think that Paul the Apostle was walking around with a wooden stake in his body, and therefore none of us believe, if we understand the text, that Paul the Apostle was talking about his literal flesh. Thorn in the flesh was the analogy. Messenger of Satan was the literal reality. And so Paul was tormented by a messenger, one who would harass verbally. So Christians are not under that power, but this doesn't mean the enemy doesn't attack us. You can be influenced, you can be attacked, and this is why I want to make it very clear. Christians need deliverance from temptation, deception, and torment, and sometimes even addiction, but that's a different message for a different time. But never do we need exorcism, which is the expelling of a demonic being from your physical being and where the demon is inhabited, inhabiting you or attached to you in some way. So watch this. I'll show that to you. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. And again, to be clear, I say this to you as someone who's had experience with the demonic, been practicing exorcism for over 20 years, practices deliverance, teaches on spiritual warfare. It's the third most popular topic on the channel. That's what I cover. Talk about the Holy Spirit, prayer, and spiritual warfare. So I'm not some cessationist coming at this saying it's not for today and so forth. No, I believe in it. But we have to get this right if we're to walk in perfect liberty. And perhaps in your heart you said, I don't know, something's just not right in my life. I feel like I'm always stuck in these cycles. I'm telling you what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a misconception. And so long as the enemy can keep you believing in his exaggerated power, well, you'll never address the power that he actually does have at its root. So put on all of God's armor so you will be able to stand against all strategies of the devil. Watch this now. And I saw a great question right now. How do I know what's causing my anxiety? We will get to Q&A, I promise you, at the end of this. Um, it may be trimmed out for the replay, but we'll see how it goes and possibly leave it in. But you can always leave comments with questions, even on the replay. Um, notice here the scripture says, stand firm against all strategies of the devil. It doesn't say some. In other words, if you do what the scripture is about to instruct, you have everything you need to stand against all the attacks of the enemy. The Greek word here for strategies literally means deceit, cunning arts, trickery. So this is all the enemy has against you. It's deception. This is the only power he has over you. It's deception. Deception can lead, again, to temptation, to torment, and deception can even lead to addiction at times. And so once we understand the power of this deception, we go, aha, I got you. I see what you're doing. This is why I'm saying the enemy is more subtle than we realize. And he gets us, as I said, to argue against our own deliverance by insisting, no, he does have power over me. Well, doesn't that sound like something the enemy wants you to believe? I find it so interesting that the only ones who seem to be under spiritual bondage are the ones who keep insisting that the enemy has actual power over them. Think about that. So notice here that the scripture tells us all strategies, all his methods. In other words, everything that he can do to you can be prevented by what? Putting on the armor. 
So watch this. Now, this does not mean that there are not other angles. This does not mean that there aren't other angles to be addressed concerning spiritual warfare. But this does mean that in regards to the spiritual attack specifically against the believer, that if we implement this, that we remain free. So once you know the lies by comparing it with the word, by comparing it with the witness of the Holy Spirit, by comparing it to what sound teachers are giving to you, now we put on the armor. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Now right there, verse 12, sometimes that's misapplied to make the point that only spiritual enemies are what we fight and therefore, we leave out teachings in regards to the flesh. But a simple reading of, say, for example, Galatians chapter 5 makes it absolutely clear that it's also our sin nature that we fight. You say, well, I thought we don't fight the flesh. Well, then tell that to Paul the Apostle, who talked in great length about the flesh. And the scriptures and epistles obviously talk about that sin nature that we're fighting when we talk about temptation. Uh, but this scripture isn't saying that's the limit of it. There's nothing else in this world. It's talking specifically about spiritual warfare. So, of course, context considered that's why it's specifying we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies in regards to this spiritual battle, which has to do with the battle for truth. Verse 13, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Resist the devil and he will flee. Here's what I don't get. People talk about this idea that the enemy has so much power that he can resist commands from spirit-filled believers. Not true. Just a simple resisting, not even fighting him. Not even combating him, not even, you know, warring against him with angelic host and the Holy Spirit's power. That's not even required. Just a simple, no, I'm resisting you, and he flees. Why? Because the moment you resist him, he recognizes that you know who you are. And so he flees from you. Nothing, the enemy fears nothing more than you realizing how little power he actually has. Now, some might say, Brother David, you shouldn't say that. You're causing people to be apathetic. Uh, shouldn't we be vigilant? Shouldn't we be aware? Shouldn't we not be ignorant of the powers of the enemy and his trickery and his deception? Absolutely. I'm talking about the difference between vigilance and paranoia. And we as believers, of course, must be aware. And I'm showing you what his attacks are. Deception. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Of course, it's talking about demonic beings. Here's how you fight them. Therefore... Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Okay, so here's what you need right here. Here we go. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of what? Truth. Watch this now. The belt of truth. The belt of what? Truth. Oh, that's simple right there. What is the belt of truth? The belt of truth, as deep as you want to study it, it's going to yield the same result. The belt of truth is truth. What is truth? The truth is the word. The truth is what the Holy Spirit communicates. Jesus is the truth. The truth. It's what is combating. It's what's in contrast to. It's what resists the lies of the enemy. Truth doesn't change. So the belt of truth is truth. How do you get the truth? I just showed you. The word, the Holy Spirit, sound teachers. Now watch this. So you put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness or the body armor of God's righteousness. Now, in context here, this would be a reference to Roman or Israeli body armor, uh, the breastplate. So it covered the whole body and it was held in place by the belt. So the breastplate being referred to here is going to be a breastplate that's held in place by the belt. In other words, righteousness is held in place by truth. If you lack righteousness in your life, it's because you don't yet realize the truth. Well, think about what it means to turn from sin. Repent means to change your mind. Renounce means to forsake. I think sometimes we get a little religious about the word renounce. We think it means to pull out a scroll <laughs> with all of our past sins, you know, flip it open, let the scroll roll down a few feet, and we uh, read down the list. I renounce this, I renounce this, I renounce this, I renounce this. You can do that if you want. There's nothing wrong with it. But if it's just words, it's not going to mean anything. Renounce means to turn away from. We get those two words confused sometimes. Renounce means to turn away from. So first I repent, I change my mind, I agree with God, this is wrong, I shouldn't do it, I shouldn't allow it in my life. Not, not now, not then, not in a small degree, not in a large degree. I agree, God, and then after I've changed my mind, I then renounce or I turn from. And so in order to do that, I have to know the truth. 
So repentance comes from first being made aware of the truth and the truth holds to us righteousness. Righteousness is rooted in truth. There again, we see our theme, the fight to believe God's truth over the enemy's lies. Watch this now. The shoes of peace represent our readiness to spread the gospel. So the Bible says here, for shoes, put on peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Now, some have said our only um, offensive weapon is the sword of the spirit. But in fact, the shoes of peace, ironically, are also a weapon of offense. But we don't conquer in the manner of worldly conquerors. We conquer by way of spreading the good news. And everywhere we step with the gospel, we take ground from the enemy and advance the kingdom of God. So now we see the shoes of peace. We advance the gospel. We advance the truth. That's what we do when we put on peace. But this again is the battle for truth. You're spreading the gospel, which is truth. Verse 17, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now watch this here. How do we know what the shield of faith is? How do we know what the helmet of salvation is? I think I skipped helm, uh, shield of faith. I might have read that over, but it's in there, uh, verse 16. So we have the shield of faith. What is the shield of faith? Faith is my belief in what God has said. Let me read verse 16. In addition to all these, watch this now. I love the language. Hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts of the devil. Oh my goodness, this is powerful. I, I get excited when I talk about truth. Okay, what is the shield of faith? The shield of faith is your belief in what God has said. What are the fiery darts of the enemy? Well, the fiery darts of the enemy are the lies that he sends our way. And so I cannot extinguish or put out those fires if I'm not raising the shield of faith. So by resisting the lies of the enemy and believing in what God has said, I extinguish what the enemy is trying to do in my life. Those fires, if you don't put them out, Deception like fire spreads if you don't address it right away. But when I hold up my belief in what God has said, then those lies that are coming my way, blocked. Nothing that the enemy can do now. Because you may tell me I'm not loved, but I extinguish that lie that I'm not loved by holding up my belief in the fact that I am loved. The enemy says he's abandoned you. Oh no, devil. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I believe that truth and therefore I extinguish that lie. And so we also move on to the helmet of salvation. Now, one of the ways to understand one particular portion of scripture is to compare it with another portion of scripture. So you take the clear teachings of scripture and through the clear teachings of scripture, you understand the sometimes ambiguous portions of scripture. Watch this, 1 Thessalonians 5.8. Did you know there's another reference to the helmet of salvation in scripture? I'll show it to you. 1 Thessalonians 5.8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So what is the helmet? It's the hope of salvation. What is hope? My belief in, my confidence in salvation. There again, we see a continuation of our theme, the fight to believe God's truth over the enemy's lies. And so then we also have the sword of the spirit. What is the sword of the spirit? It's the word of truth. You guys, it's right here. To fight against all the methods of the enemy, what do you need? Truth. Every single element of the armor of God has to do with truth. And so we fight the enemy's lies by equipping ourselves with the truth. Now watch this. Here's where it gets a little complicated for many people. You may be watching this and you go, I've heard this before. Or I tried that, it didn't work for me. Let God be true and every man a liar. Because I used to say that. I used to say, well, I already tried belief in the truth. It just doesn't work. No, no, my friend. The belief in the truth is not something that you try to see if it works. Belief in truth is a lifestyle. And as you continue in that lifestyle, you go from glory to glory, from liberty to liberty. Now watch this. You want the truth to permeate your life. Number one, you got to choose to believe the truth. Yes, belief is a choice. You choose what thoughts you meditate upon. You choose what you believe. I don't care what anyone's told you. The Bible tells us that when we believe, it's a choice. We choose to believe. Your belief in truth 
is a commitment that you're going to have to make here and now. You want to be done with this? Then you got to get serious. Don't tell me you're serious about liberty. Don't tell me you're serious about walking in freedom if you quit after two weeks. If you throw up your hands and say, well, I already tried that. Let me go try to get a quick fix. And then we start to dabble in religious traditions that keep people bound. Look, I know people get angry with me when I talk about this. Whenever you speak truth, you stir up religious spirits. And I speak against religion. I speak against the the traditions of man. I speak against the establishment that keeps people bound. This is where people start to get tied up and, well, the truth didn't work for me. God's word didn't work for me. So let me go try something else. Then they borrow from teachings of the new age and the occult. Maybe it was a soul tie, some tether between me and another person. Where's that in the Bible? It's not. Well, maybe it's some generational curse and we start blaming our ancestors because we're not taking responsibility. Now, I did say demons attack us generationally, but generational attack is different than a generational curse. Demons will strategize against you and they'll use alcohol on the son if alcohol worked on the father But alcoholism isn't going to work on the son unless the son chooses to make the same decisions as his father. You see, if you say curse, now you're implying that you have no responsibility. Now you can throw up your hands and say, well, someone else has to do it for me. Maybe it's a specific prayer. Maybe if I find the type of demon that it is. Was it a water demon, a fire demon, a plant demon? I'm thinking, are we casting out demons or Pokemon here? What are we doing in the body of Christ? Show me the scripture. You want to know the true power of the Holy Ghost. You want to go deeper, you got to rise above religion. Look, you can get from California to Florida by driving, but flying is much better. And I'm telling you, we have to fight this from the seed of truth. You get down in the dirt with the enemy, you get into all the complication. I'm not pagan. I'm not of the New Age. I'm not going to borrow doctrines from them because they said it works. All of those belief systems, by the way, are based on lies. Why would you believe anything that comes from systems based on lies? I'm not going to borrow from the new age. I'm not going to borrow from the occult. Say, well, this is what they teach. Maybe we use that. No, everything I need to know is right here in the word. And if God tells it to us, it works. So when the scripture says that the truth sets you free, it works. You see, I've talked to even some believers who say, well, I used to think that, David. I used to think Christians couldn't be cursed until I experienced it. I say, really? So you're telling me you used to believe the word of God until your story contradicted it. It's not the word of God you believe, it's yourself. These are things we have to address. We have to humble ourselves under the word. The word is the highest authority, not our experiences. Our experiences count. Our experiences matter. Yes, of course. But we have to interpret what is actually happening. How do we describe those spiritual dynamics? We have to describe those things through the word. And so, when we say, well, I already tried that, let me go try some other method, you're basically of the belief that the word of God doesn't have all the answers. The Holy Spirit's power isn't good enough. What an insult to his power. I know I'm I'm, I'm stepping on some toes here, but some toes need to be stepped on. I don't want to just step on your toes. I'm going to break your legs right now. We We need to be done with this. We have to grow beyond it. We have to mature. We have, believer, we have to grow up. We have to grow up. And if you want to grow in the Holy Spirit, you base your life on the Word. On the Word, not on what the occult says. Not on what New Age says. On the Word. And this is the real power of the deception of the enemy. Because now, he pulls us into his tactics, his belief systems, And we've embraced them as Christians. Why on earth would we do that? Why on earth would we embrace the devil's tactics that are taught in in systems of demonic doctrine? Tell me. Why elevate that over the word? So we believe the word. So you have to commit to believing the truth. And if you say, I already tried that, it didn't work, I say to you, let God be true and every man a liar. If God says truth will set you free, And you say, the truth didn't set me free? Who should we believe? For example, the Bible tells us, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. Some say, I did seek him with all my heart. I didn't find him. Well, you didn't seek him with all your heart then. Because he said, he said, if you seek him with all your heart, you'll find him. So you have to believe the truth. That's the first step. And you have to filter your thoughts through the word. If you don't know the word, how are you supposed to filter it? Guys, I'm giving you meat tonight, not milk. 
We're moving past the milk. We're getting into the meat. You have to believe the truth despite what the lies of the enemy say. He will use your feelings. He will use your emotions. He will use your experiences. He will use your problems. He will use your mental illness. He will use people around you. He will use whatever it takes to endorse his lies. No matter what, you have to say, I resist those lies. I resist them, and I choose to believe the truth. And then we're going to get deeper now. You have to fight what I call reinforcing lies. Now, this is something that's not often talked about. When the enemy tells you a lie, that's the primary lie. But do you realize that there are lies that he tells us that keep us from even addressing the lie? Do you realize the enemy doesn't just use one lie on you? He uses many. So for example, if you're bound in depression, the lie could be, God doesn't love me. And then the moment the truth comes along, God does love you, you just have to believe that truth. You may tell yourself something like, oh, I already tried that. Oh, I already attempted that and it's not going to work for me. Boom, there's the reinforcing lie. Now, I'm not saying by any means that you can just think happy thoughts and get set free. No, I'm talking about a spiritual discipline, a lifestyle of choosing to think according to the patterns of truth instead of the patterns of the lies. And so I believe the truth now. That's a choice. I believe it. I live according to it. And then I have to stop those lies. I have to combat those reinforcing lies that keep me from addressing it. Another example, let's say you're battling with anxiety. You battled it, you battled it for years. So now you're cynical. You don't think anything's going to work. So when someone tells you where well, the Holy Spirit can set you free, you say, well, maybe others, but not me. Or maybe you believe the lie that that's just who you are. It's a part of your personality that you'll always just be anxious. But that's a lie. That's a lie of the enemy. You have to not just identify the lie but the lies that keep you from even addressing the lie. And that's why I'm coming so hard against things like generational curses and soul ties. I'm going to say this a third and final time. I practice exorcism, deliverance. Um, I, I, I teach spiritual warfare. I believe in demonic possession. I believe believers should be practicing it. I believe deliverance is for today. But guys, we have to get back to the Word. The Word, that's where there's power. That's where there's true depth. Don't refer me to a bunch of complicated ideas and refer to that complication as depth. True depth is simplicity. True depth is, is knowledge of the word. True depth is simple trust in what God has said. And then you have to renew the mind. I see a lot of people in the comments saying, thank you for this, thank you for this, and hopefully things are, are clicking for you. I've had many people listen to these teachings and after years and years and years of torment, once they finally accepted these truths, suddenly they're free. Suddenly the bondage is broken. Suddenly they're like, whoa, is this what peace feels like? Because God loves you too much to leave you in the power of darkness. Then you need to renew the mind. And renew the mind is now proactive, where you, starting, you start to not only not think according to the lies and fight those lies and filter out those lies, but now you're starting to think according to the truth. This is where I tell people, I, I beg you, I'm begging you, please understand your identity. You're not some defeated person in the spirit realm, weak and, you know, with your cloak over your head and walking through the snowstorm and just barely surviving and hungry and thirsty and, oh, this wearied soldier who just can't make it. My friend, you're not, you, you're not even on the field. You're seated on the throne with Christ, seated in heavenly places. We're seated with Him. Christ is in power and I am in Christ. Christ is in authority and I am in Christ. Christ is in victory and I am in Christ. Christ stands in victory. I stand in Christ. And the moment you know this, you stop trying to battle the enemy on his terms. Let me fight his incantations with incantations. Let me fight his rituals with rituals. Let me fight his power with, with what I think is power. No, my friend, you've got to go deeper than that. You've got to go deeper than that. It's time to rise above religious tradition. Rise, and I know, again, I upset the religious establishment. Just, Jesus did it. It's okay to shake things up. Friends of the Holy Spirit tend to do that. 
It's okay to believe the truth. Don't be guilted into not embracing those lies. That's an attack of the enemy. I'm telling you, that's how subtle he is. And this sets you free from things like addiction. You say, how, how does this work for addiction? Well, think about the fact that the addiction only began in the first place because of a choice. That choice only was made in the first place because of a cycle that someone was living in. You know where I'm going with this. That cycle came from a mindset. That mindset came from a lie. Addiction is a physical result of a deceptive thought pattern. In other words, you live under the power of a lie so much and for so long that now it finally begins to affect the physical realm. Depression, fear, torment, accusation, these are all rooted in deception in some way. You can be free. You can be free. It is your day of freedom today. So here's what we're going to do. I'll, I'll give you this last bit of truth and then we'll go from there. Uh, I want to pray with you right now. And don't turn this off. Listen, you didn't come this far just to miss out on what God is going to do right now. When you address a stronghold, you have to realize there's a demonic aspect of the stronghold and there's a fleshly aspect of a stronghold. The demonic aspect is simple. Demonic beings lie to you. They torment you. They can, they can project voices, images, hallucinations. They, they can deceive you into thinking that they've inhabited you. And I'm talking to born-again believers. If you're not a born-again believer and you think you have a demon in you, you're probably right. But if you're a born-again believer, the enemy is going to try to deceive you into thinking he has more power over you than he does. This is how deceptive he is, I'm telling you. And so how he does it is through lies, projections, exaggerations of his power. Like a shadow projected on the wall, so the enemy projects his power before us and says, this is what I have over you. And some of us believers just go, okay, yeah, you do. And then we act as if we, we grant him the premise. We grant him the premise of, okay, you do have the power over me how do I get out of it? No, my friend, you get out of that torment by realizing you have no power over me. I have no attachments with you. You say, what about open doors? Open doors, biblically speaking, an open door is anything that makes you more susceptible to deception. Yes, you can do things that invite greater levels of attack and influence, but the enemy cannot inhabit you. The enemy cannot dwell in you. And again, there's questions around this I know, like why do we sometimes see Christians manifest? Or what do you say to those who say we... That's a whole different lesson for a whole different time. I actually have a teaching on my channel on that that addresses some of those specifically. And there are biblically solid answers for those things. But we're not getting into that right now. Right now, I just want to talk to you about truth. And so the enemy grants, we grant him the premise, okay, you do have that power over me. And then we fight from that place of defeat, not realizing that we've already given up ground when we grant that premise. That's how deceptive he is. So now we come to the place where we say, devil, you have no power. I recognize who I am in Christ. And, and you rebuke him. You want to know how to get rid of demons? You, if you want to exercise or expel a demon from an unbeliever, as a believer, you speak a command, tell it to go. And if the authority of the Holy Spirit is actually working in you, it will go. Period. No, no fights. Jesus didn't fight them. The disciples didn't fight them. It just goes. That's biblical. Now, you say, what happens if it stays? If it stays, two things. Either you have to go pray and fast to increase your faith. If that doesn't work, then you can conclude that's an emotional or mental problem. Why? Because if it was demonic, it would have left when you rebuked it. Simple. How do I base that? It's on the word. So you address the demonic aspect through a rebuke under authority. Done. Now what you have to do is work on the fleshly aspect. This is the truly hard part. This is where now you have to commit to new thought patterns. Choose to believe the truth. Renew the mind. Have faith in what God has said. You walk in that, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. How do you walk away from darkness? You step into the light. How do you walk in liberty? You walk in the Holy Spirit. I've never met a Christian who prayed regularly, read the word with depth, lived in holiness, walked in faith, and at the same time walked under the power of the enemy. I've never met that Christian. My point is, the hope is that you don't have to settle. Please hear me. Don't argue against your deliverance. Some Christians just love the idea of having their demons, and I don't know why. 
Maybe they like to blame them. Maybe it's difficult for the ego to embrace that maybe I didn't get this right doctrinally. But don't argue against your deliverance. Deliverance is God's gift to you. Don't fight the Holy Spirit. Embrace the truth. You are not your confusion. You are not your intrusive thoughts. You are not your depression. You are not that anxiety. You are a child of the Most High God. And the moment you realize this, that's the breakthrough. Walking in that truth, that's where freedom comes. Father, I pray that every voice of the enemy would be silenced. I come against every deceiving spirit that would speak those lies that cause them to be bound. Be silent now in the name of Jesus. And now, Lord, help that one to deal with the flesh, to tear down these strongholds to the exercise of truth. Father, I pray that when the lies are swirling around them, when the storms of deception are raging, that they would cling to the anchor that is true. Holy Spirit, take them to higher places. Holy Spirit, take them to deeper waters, I pray. Teach them what it is to truly mature in you, precious Holy Spirit. Teach them what it is, I pray, to walk with you. Ask him to do it. Say this out loud. And I want you to confess this. Say, devil, you have no power over me. Say it right now in the name of Jesus. I want you to say it with boldness. Say, devil, you have no power over me. I am spirit-filled, blood-bought, redeemed. Say it. Say, I am redeemed. Say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Say, I belong to Jesus. Now, Spirit, I pray you break every chain. Reveal to them those areas of deception. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. I want you to say it because you believe it. Say, amen. Now, in a moment, I will be taking your questions. So stay with us. Any follow-up questions you have, and if you're watching the replay again, we may take the Q&A out because that's just what we do for the sake of time and algorithm and so forth. But if you have questions, put them in the comments. I may revisit this video from time to time and answer the questions in the comment section. So believers, I know that when you learn the truth, sometimes there's some remnants of an old mindset and maybe some loose ends in your mind and you're saying, well, if that's the truth, then what about this? What about this? What about this? I will take all sincere questions in just a moment. But first, let me encourage you. If you were blessed by this, and you want to help others be blessed by this, you want to help others find their liberty through the truth of the Word of God, then I want you to back this ministry. Consider now becoming a monthly ministry supporter by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner or giving a single donation by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Your support of this ministry helps us continue what we're doing. Your support of this ministry helps us continue with the media, the live streams, the events, this beautiful studio that we're now sitting in, a facility where we hold events, where our staff works, where we plan events that we hold around the world. Bottom line, we are in the battle for a soul of a generation. And if you can give me their eyes and their ears, please hear me. If you can give me their eyes and their ears, I can win their soul. And I know that because I'm confident in the word of God. I'm confident in the word of God. And the word of God has the power to set this generation free. What we are doing is expanding the kingdom. We're not talking about it, we're doing it. It's not talk, it's action, demonstration, power, truth going forward. And I want you to get involved. There are millions around the world who are being impacted by this ministry. Tens of thousands of you who support this ministry. Join the efforts, join our ranks if you will. Get engaged in this battle for the soul of a generation. If you're saying, man, I wish someone would do something about what's happening in our world, you can be that someone right here, right now to do something. There is no gift so small that it doesn't matter. And there is no gift so large that we wouldn't know what to do with it if we got it. Every gift counts, small or large, single gift or monthly gift. All of it makes an impact. Go right now and contribute to this cause. 
I will read now just a few of you who give. I see some of the donations coming in right now. Like, for example, I see uh, Karen on YouTube. I see different people uh, giving um, on the Facebook. I know Steve's looking at those. You don't have to read them right now, Steve, but I see them too. I'm going to read some of them here. Many, many givers from around the world. Monique, thank you for your support. Albert, thank you for becoming a partner. Charm, thank you for being a partner. Terry, thank you for being a partner. Uh, Vivian, thanks for becoming a partner. Rodrigo, thanks for being a partner. Iana, thanks for being a partner. Angela, thanks for being a partner. Many, many, many of you supporting. Jacob, thank you for the gift. I'm just so blessed to see that support. So again, if you want to get involved, look, some of you support streaming platforms. That's a different discussion for a different time. Maybe you watch positive things on those streaming platforms. That's fine. No one's saying you can't have streaming platforms. But if we can support streaming platforms in the world who charge people for their content, why can't we support a ministry that's giving it all away for free? Do it now. Support today. Everything counts. Don't say someone else. Don't say some other time. Let it be you. DavidHernandezMinistries.com slash partner to give a monthly gift. DavidHernandezMinistries.com slash donate to give a single gift. And now we'll take some questions. Tim, go ahead and pull this up on the screen. And again, we may move these out because sometimes people write things on the screen that are not appropriate, but we'll see where we go from there. Um, I'm going to be looking actually on my, Tim, is it okay if I just move this slightly into the shot there? I can see some of my, my questions coming in now. Um, someone says, I'm a monthly partner, Pastor David. Uh, your ministry has helped me tremendously uh, that I was set free January 28th, 2023. Praise God. Uh, any questions you have on this topic? I want to stay um, on a topic. Okay, Julie E., how does a person get free from a mental illness if it's not a demon? Well, this is something that I think I could speak to because uh, to some degree, I did have a mental illness. I mean, the fact that I had a panic attack. And Tim, once I read the question, we'll do this. This way, we run uh, less of a risk of having someone write something on the comment section that doesn't work. And I see sleep paralysis. I'm going to talk about sleep paralysis in a moment. So once I read the question, take it down, and then I'll tell you when to bring it back up. So go ahead and take, take that down right now, uh, the comments. And I'll answer the question in regards to mental illness. Look, um, I myself battled severely uh, for years the ugliness that is anxiety and panic attacks. I literally thought I was dying on a daily basis. I would have sometimes up to three panic attacks a day. My wife remembers this. Steve, you remember that season of my life? Right. We'd be out just hanging out, and you know, it, would, it was horrible. It was just like this physical reaction to the fear. Now, what I was struggling with is nowhere near as severe as what many of you are struggling with. But I can tell you this, in any mental illness, there are going to possibly be some demonic aspects and some uh, physical aspects, if you will. The demonic aspect is simple. Demons agitate and stir those inclinations that we have in the mind. In other words, if you're prone to anxiety, demons are going to keep telling you lies that make you more fearful. If you're prone to depression, demons are going to keep telling you things that agitate that depression. In other words, demons help to prolong, agitate, and intensify the mental illnesses that we have. And we have to acknowledge both elements. Some believers are so religious that they won't let you acknowledge the physical elements of a mental illness. And some believers are so pragmatic that they won't acknowledge the demonic elements of a mental illness. We have to acknowledge both. There are both demonic and physical elements to a mental illness, but you have to understand how that plays out. As a believer, as I said, look, it's a well-established fact in the Christian world, in the Scripture. I can't even believe this is discussed and debated because after reading Scripture, understanding the Holy Spirit's power, the nature of the new creation, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, you understand what happened when you were saved. I don't even understand why it's even a debate. It's, and, I, and I do to some degree because... The belief that Christians can be demon-possessed is the foundation of a whole subculture of ministry that if you remove that belief, suddenly certain things just aren't necessary anymore. So I understand the self-preservation that's involved with that, um, but you have to understand that as a born-again believer, and again, I'm telling you this as someone who practices exorcism, believes in demon possession, practices deliverance, teaches deliverance, thinks Christians should practice deliverance, I write on spiritual warfare, I teach on spiritual warfare. If anything, I'm labeled as a hyper-charismatic who talks about these things too much. But we have to acknowledge the truth as well. 
And I'm telling you this as someone who's practiced deliverance ministry for over 20 years, that Christians cannot be demonized. Demonized literally means possessed. That definition of the word, there's a lot of play on words there, but the word demonized in the Greek literally means possessed. So if anyone ever tells you, well, there is no word in the original language for possessed, that's a lie. The word demonized literally means just that. And I'm not saying they're lying intentionally. Some people just don't know. They pass information down from generation to generation. And in doing so, they just spread the rumor, if you will. So demonization is always a reference to full-on demon possession, even if you use a synonym like under the power of. In that case, under the power of would mean possession. So you never see that verse or that word, I should say, used in reference to a born-again believer. So as a Christian who battles with mental illness, the way you combat the demonic aspect, and again, you can still be attacked by demons, you can still be influenced by demons, Uh, demons still play a real role in the element of spiritual warfare in the life of the believer. I'm not saying we should be ignorant of these things, but if you're battling with mental illness, then yes, there is going to be a spiritual element, but that spiritual element is simply that they lie, they agitate, they torment, they accuse, they use their voices. Demons use their voices against you, and in so doing, they can create this exaggeration of their power. So the way you deal with demons is by exercising authority. A simple command, a simple rebuke, that will get rid of them. If it doesn't work, then you need to fast and pray, and then that authority is exercised. Why is that? Because when you rebuke a demonic power in the name of Jesus, you're not using your authority. You're using Christ's authority. When a born-again believer rebukes a demon, it's as if Jesus himself is rebuking that demon, okay? So the demon cannot resist. This idea of them back and forth, no, I won't go, no, I want to stay, That's nowhere in the Bible, and a lot of that is just uh, based upon misunderstanding of how it should be carried out. I know this because I used to practice it that way, and then the Holy Spirit showed me a better way. I was set free from my old religious mindset. Now, religion will insist you do it that way and actually say you're not really practicing deliverance if you don't do that, when in fact that's just, again, a legalistic tactic that's used to beat us into submission using fear and guilt. But As a born-again believer now, you have this power over them that you didn't have before. You step into that authority through faith. So if you are aligned with that authority, that authority will always work, period, and instantaneously so. You say, then how do I have lingering effects? What's going on there? Well, the lingering effects come from what's left over after you rebuke the demonic attack. And again, when it comes to a born-again believer, you rebuke the demonic being and tell it to stop using its voice. In the case of the unbeliever, you cast out that devil. If you have questions on that, of course, I can get into that too. I know there'll be questions on that, and I probably already know which scripture would be brought up with it um, because I used to bring that up. So you deal with the mental aspects by taking your medication. on, on, On that idea of medication, there are some who will abuse that. There are some psychiatrists who over medicate and so forth, but there is some legitimacy to that. I'm not gonna say that uh, it's 100% legitimate all the time. I'll I'll admit in recent years, my faith in the medical community has been shaken. But, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with counseling. And then we have phrases, right? Real real puffed up phrases. Well, you can counsel it out. I'm going to cast it out. Oh, I'm so powerful, right? I used to say things like that, right? Um, But why not both? Why not rebuke the demon, deal with that in the authority of Christ, but then take practical measures to take care of your mental health? Get rest. Be around people. I've seen this work wonders. I've seen this work wonders in people who dealt with schizophrenic symptoms. And then they went from hearing voices, tormented, worried about everything, to suddenly they're level, they're normal, they're filled with joy and peace and haven't gone back to it. And this is why I say some of these doctrines that really are false doctrines, they agitate people's mental illnesses. That's why I think a lot of these doctrines that are out there right now they're going to result in severe mental illness for a lot of Christians because I found that the belief that a born-again believer has a demon actually does a lot of damage for a born-again believer who suffers with mental illness. Why? Because if I, do, if I suffer with anxiety, well, now you're just feeding my anxiety. If I suffer with uh, schizophrenia or hallucinations, now you're just feeding my hallucinations. But the moment you come to the truth and realize, yes, I may be attacked by demons, that's a reality. Yes, I may be influenced by demons. That's a reality too. But I have authority over those attacks. I can come against the enemy. I'm not seated from a vulnerable place. I have power over them. Once you realize that, well, then now you can combat that demonic aspect successfully. And then you move on to dealing with the issues of the flesh by renewing the mind, believing the truth, fighting the reinforcing lies, taking practical measures, 
counsel, fellowship. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that you're not going to have a battle, but don't confuse the battle for a bondage. Christians are going to have battles for the rest of their lives with the flesh. You can't cast you out of you. So you deal with those things. I know in my case with anxiety, it was so bad I couldn't get out of bed. I wouldn't get in the car. I wouldn't leave my house. My brother over here, Steve, can testify to that. And I'm telling you, I'm set free today. I'm free from that anxiety. And I know it can happen for you too. And though the enemy still may tempt me to think anxiously, though the enemy may still attack me with anxious thoughts, I know now that I have the power over that. Now I want to answer the question in regards to this idea of sleep paralysis, because this comes up a lot. Christians ask, well, if demons can't attack Christians physically, then how do you explain sleep paralysis? Well, it's very simple, actually. Your body, every single night, whether you experience sleep paralysis or not, your body, every single night, paralyzes itself. That's part of your body's natural process for falling asleep. And the reason that your body does this is so that you don't wake yourself up if you have an active dream. So let's say you're having a dream of running or fighting or falling off of a cliff. Your body paralyzes itself so that you don't kick your legs and wake yourself up. Now, some of you have experienced it before where you have a dream of falling and you jerk your body and you wake yourself up. Okay, the sleep paralysis failed you then. Now, here's what happens. Sometimes, and there are contributing factors to this, like if you eat super late before bed, if you go to bed super late, and believe it or not, if you sleep on your back facing up, which is why you're always facing up when sleep, I shouldn't say always, you're most often facing up when you have sleep paralysis. Um, that right there is a physical, biological occurrence. So what happens is your body, your brain, doesn't realize that the body is still in sleep mode. So your brain, if you will, your alertness comes onto the scene, you come out of it mentally, so you're aware you're no longer sleeping, but your body hasn't received the signal yet that it's not sleeping. So that paralysis hasn't worn off. Now, some might say, Brother David, you're teaching on things you know nothing about. You need to go deeper. But it's only because I've gone deeper that I've come to realize these truths. I used to teach exactly the opposite of this. And by the way, I used to have sleep paralysis on a nightly occurrence. This is when I was dealing with those panic attacks. And so what happens is the enemy... In that moment of your vulnerability, here is how deceptive he is. The enemy, in the moment of your vulnerability, here's what he's going to do now. He's going to say, okay, I'm going to attack them now demonically. So some people say, well, I thought sleep paralysis was a demonic attack. In part, it is. But this is where Christians need to understand just how subtle the enemy is. Now, you may say, this doesn't sit right in my spirit, or I don't know about that. Go research it. Don't just dismiss what I'm saying because it's different than what you've been told. Don't just dismiss what I'm saying because you don't want to believe what I'm telling you. Don't dismiss what I'm saying because other preachers are telling you the opposite. Go compare what I'm saying to the word. Compare what I'm saying to reality and you'll find, go do the study. What is sleep paralysis? There are studies on this. They can measure this in a lab and show you what's happening in your body. Now that doesn't mean that the enemy doesn't use it because some would say, well, wait a minute. I remember the demon was on top of me. It was choking me. I saw it in the corner of the room. Me too. I experienced that. Let me tell you how this works. So in the moment that you're experiencing sleep paralysis, the devil looks and he goes, aha, now I'm going to take advantage of them to exaggerate my power. I'm going to show them a demonic image. There is a projection. He doesn't have to be within you or attach himself to you to show you a projection because the projection is a lie. Just like I can lie to you Anyone can lie to you without possessing you. Anyone can lie to you without attaching themselves to you. Anyone can do it. Anyone can cause you fear, anxiety, confusion without attaching themselves to you or inhabiting you. So the enemy can lie to you, which causes fear, anxiety, and so forth, without attaching himself to you. So he does a projection. There's that thing in the corner. Here's what's on top of you. Now, I know this because it happened to me. I would wake up. Something would be choking me. I would see the dark figure in the corner. And I thought for years, the enemy has the power to choke me. Then I started thinking about it. Well, what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. How can the enemy even touch a body inhabited by the Holy Spirit, first of all? Second of all, if it's true that the enemy can, in fact, physically harm us, why does he always wait till you're half asleep, lying in bed, and just coming out of sleep? I mean, if the enemy could attack us physically, and sickness, by the way, is a whole different subject. I know some might have had a question about that. Sickness is a whole different subject. We can talk about that if you want to. 
but we're talking specifically about sleep paralysis right now. If the enemy could physically attack you, why wouldn't he do it at other moments? Why only during sleep paralysis? And so what happens is now the enemy uses that moment of sleep paralysis, the moment of your vulnerability, to exaggerate his power over you and make you think he has power over you to physically harm you. Now, once I realized that truth, guess what? Even though my sleep paralysis continued, suddenly the demonic imagery and the fear were gone. In fact, my anxiety over those demonic attacks, which again, sleep paralysis can be used for a demonic attack. Let me say it this way so there's no confusion. When it comes to sleep paralysis and demonic visitations during sleep paralysis, it is partially demonic, partially physical. The physical part is your body not being able to move, that choking sensation. The demonic aspect is the projections. That's the deception. And this is perfectly consistent with the word in reality. And so once I overcame that lie that the enemy could attack me physically, suddenly I was no longer seeing the demonic projections. Suddenly I no longer saw him on top of me choking me. Now, I still had the sleep paralysis, but it wasn't even scary anymore. It was just like, oh, well, this is inconvenient. And then I learned I have to start sleeping better. I have to stop eating so late before I go to bed and I even stop sleeping on my back. Sleep paralysis, gone. Never another problem. First, I dealt with the demonic aspect. This goes back to what I'm teaching you. I dealt with the demonic aspect by rebuking the enemy. Boom, it's done. And then I dealt with the physical aspect by taking care of my physical health. And so... This is a biological reality that the enemy uses to exaggerate his power. That's what sleep paralysis is. Now, by the way, think about the cycle you would catch yourself in if you believed it was a demonic being. Think about how worked up you get. <gasps> the devil physically attacked me. Where's the open door? Is God angry? Is somebody putting a curse on me? And suddenly you're off to the races. Your mind is busy. And what happens? The more tormented you become by that idea, the less sleep you get. The less sleep you get, the more often sleep paralysis is likely to occur. The enemy is tricky indeed. And this is how subtle he is. That's what I'm saying. People don't realize just how subtle the enemy is. And he has you if you think that he physically can touch you. He's not given that power. So let's look now here at some of the questions here. Um, this is good here. Yes, there were times where I had sleep paralysis and woke up. And it was like, I'm tired of this and wasn't even scared and went straight to bed. Yes, this is true. That's what happened to me first. Uh, let me see here. The I wish I could go slow mode on my end. I don't know if I can. Uh, someone recommended a video. Maybe we'll check it out. What's the most effective way of rebuking the enemy? Live right. Have faith in Christ's authority and then speak the command. It really is that simple. You don't see anything else in Scripture. Like this idea of training to rebuke demons. Who, what training? Either you have the authority or you don't. Either you have the power of the Holy Ghost or you don't. Now, I understand being trained in spiritual warfare, learning dynamics of the Spirit, but in terms of practice, like how you actually go about rebuking the devil, why would I need techniques when it's not even my power? Like people ask me, for example, about the healing ministry. I can teach you about how to increase your faith. I can teach you about how to study the word in the area of healing. I can teach you about uh, removing distractions so that people can listen to what you're saying and have their faith stirred. I can teach you about the fact that it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. But I, don't, I can't teach you like, okay, if it's a headache, you're going to place two fingers on each side on the temple and then put two thumbs, each thumb, one under each eye. And that's how you rebuke it. Like I'm thinking like, that's not even biblical. Now, if the Holy Spirit leads you to do it a certain way at a certain moment, okay, but let's not take what the Holy Spirit reveals as revelation and turn it into ritual. Uh, there are no techniques for this. And this is where, again, I tell people you got to go deeper. I, am, I used to be a proponent of these things. I taught them for many years. And they, they get the job done, guys. I'm not saying they're bad. Like I used to do, you know, angels stab them, you know, come out of the mouth, come out of the mouth. You know, oh, I, I, I'm going to send fire now. on the, I used all of that for years. And guess what? It worked but it didn't work because of the techniques I was applying. It worked despite the techniques I was applying. And by the way, you do it that way, you find this arrogance that begins to, form, uh, get, begins to arise because now you're thinking, oh, this is me. The demons are leaving because of my techniques. The demons are leaving because of the way I'm doing things. The demons are leaving because of my vast amount of spiritual knowledge. And I was so arrogant to think that. I'm just, I'm, I, I'll repent a thousand times before the people of God. 
and I've removed lots of my old teachings on those things. And I teach on these things because I don't like to be, I don't want people to connect me with that kind of uh, view on it. Now, I've seen people deliver it that way, but again, God was merciful. He, he worked even through my ignorance. Now I realize it's a rebuke. I have the Holy Spirit. I have Christ's authority. The devil has to listen, period. And this is why I say, if the demon doesn't seem to be responding when you're casting it out, go back and fast and pray. Come back and try it again. And if it doesn't work at that point, now you're dealing with likely a mental illness. And you say, how can that be? How can you know that so confidently? Well, because if it was a demon, the Bible shows us what demons do when you rebuke them. They leave. So simple deductive reasoning based upon biblical truth, not on um, experience alone. Let's continue now. Is it wise for people to lay hands on you? Um, I mean, if you're doing it gently, of course. I'm gonna forgive me, guys, if I go, if I seem a little off here. Um, I'm just trying to scroll through this uh, this question. Okay, Julie's D. David, what about those who have confessed Christ as Lord, and then within months during regular prayer for them, they physically, supernaturally manifest, not emotionally. What is that that's happening? Julie's Jules, I believe. Great question, and I think this is so important because nine times out of ten, well, I shouldn't say that because I'm going to mention two options here. Whenever I say that Christians cannot be demonized or possessed, people think and they hear that I'm saying that Christians can't be attacked or deceived. That's not true. Christians can be attacked and affected, deceived, and influenced. Christians sometimes need deliverance from temptation, from deception, from torment, but never exorcism from a demon inhabiting their body and attaching itself to them, you know, where they're screaming and the demon speaking for them. Guys, I'm just going to give it to you plainly. And, and you might not hear this many other places, but I'm going to give you the truth. I'm not here to tickle itching ears, okay? Either the person is genuinely demon-possessed or they're genuinely a Christian, but they can't be both. That's the harsh reality. So you, people say, so what are you saying, David? When people come up to you, do, they, do you just turn them away and tell them Christians can't have demons? No. Someone comes to me and they're manifesting, I will always, first and foremost, cast it out. And if it doesn't come out right away, I say, okay, maybe we need to fast and pray. And if it doesn't come out after that, I say, it's probably emotion, programmed thinking, um, mental illness that was agitated by false doctrines. There's so many different avenues you can go. But of all the, biblical ex all the biblically consistent explanations that we have for this, why would we ever reach for the one that's biblically contradictory, namely the one that says that Christians can be demonized? Now, in your case, Jules, I would probably say that it wasn't a true case of demonic possession. Now, don't think, I know right off the bat, you say, but it was so real, I experienced it. And you probably did have a real supernatural encounter. But here's the problem. We have to learn to interpret these supernatural encounters through the word. So Jules, let me be clear. You most certainly had a supernatural encounter. That's what I'm willing to bet. Something happened there. But what tends to happen is often when Christians are being set free from deception or they're set free from, you know, uh, uh, torment, there's a very strong reaction to that. Now, I know in the question you phrased it like, and it wasn't emotional. That's what you said. But that actually probably is more revealing than you think. That was probably a thought that came to your mind. Maybe it was emotion and you immediately dismissed it. I would say explore that a little more. I think you had a genuine deliverance. I think you were truly being set free from deception. I think you were truly being set free from torment or attack. I think, some, I think the power of God was really working in you. But I think even though you had a genuine experience, you had an emotional reaction to a genuine experience. Guys, I've been there. I'm, and Jules, I'm not trying to shame you. And thank you for asking such a bold question and asking it so, being so transparent and putting yourself out there like that. that that's, that's really commendable. Um, I myself have done this. Like there were instances where I felt the power of God on me when I was a teenager. And, you know, I felt my body shaking. And I, I let out this, you know, this yell, like God's touching me. I look back now, I realize, okay, the power I felt on me, that was real. But the yell, that was an emotional response to an actual spiritual encounter. So please hear what I'm not saying. I am not saying that if you respond emotionally that your encounter wasn't real. I'm saying that you had a genuine supernatural encounter, but that the emotional aspect of it was likely an emotional response. And that's okay. 
That doesn't mean God didn't touch you. That doesn't mean it wasn't a genuine experience. That doesn't mean your experience doesn't count. It just means that we have to be consistent with the word. And those are the options we have. Either someone is demonized genuinely or saved genuinely, but the two cannot be one. Like square circle, married bachelor, demon-possessed Christian. Those are the same, uh, those are consistent in terms of their contradiction in terms. That's not an actual thing that can happen. You read the scripture and that will show you that. So follow-up questions might be, well, it was real to me. Okay, again, you probably did experience something real. But having heard the teachings before, having been programmed to respond a certain way, sometimes people do this. Think about it. With someone with a mental illness, you tell them you could have demons and not know it. By the way, that's not even biblical. Hidden demons, demons that hide in the soul. Well, first of all, there's no such thing as soul possession in Scripture. Nowhere in the Scripture. Show it to me. You're not going to find it. Demons don't exercise their power over our will. They only possess bodies, and they can't possess the body of the believer because of the Holy Spirit within them. So simple deductive reasoning based on biblical truths, the the Bible starts to create barriers and starts to narrow us in on explanations. So there's many different explanations for that. A, they could be so desperate for deliverance that they respond in a way that they think they need to in order to be free. B, they could be having an emotional response to a genuinely real spiritual encounter. Number three, it could be, C, it could be a mental illness response. Uh, D, in very rare cases, it could be that they're faking it. And A, B, C, D, E, E, it could be that they're not really a Christian. But we have five explanations, guys. I just gave you five different explanations for why we sometimes see Christians manifest. And you want to go with the one that contradicts Scripture? Why? Why would we ever do that? Because we're so, we're so committed to what we've been taught. We're so committed to things, right? Well, well David, and people have told me this, David, you're not an expert in this, and you need to leave it to the experts. I'm thinking, well, what makes someone an expert? I'm not looking at someone's expertise. I'm looking at the Word. Who cares what anybody else says? Who cares what I say? Look to the Word. Um, I I saw sleep paralysis come up again. If you rewind it, we address sleep paralysis. Uh, Please speak on sickness. Sickness, okay, sickness is a physical reality in this world. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, a little wine for the stomach's sake would do you well. Uh, Epaphrodites, when he was traveling with Paul the Apostle, was so sick that he nearly died. Um, Lazarus was so sick that he did die, and Jesus didn't heal him. He just resurrected him after he had died. Um, So we look throughout the New Testament, and we can see various different examples of Christians having sickness. So this idea, there's this notion, right? Someone will say, well, saying Christians can't have demons is like saying Christians can't be sick because it was covered under the blood and the new covenant and the curse was broken. Uh, But that's not accurate to say, specifically because the Bible delineates between a sickness and a demon. Biblically speaking, a sickness is not a demon. If I have a virus in my body, I have a virus. That virus is not a sentient spiritual being that comes from another world. It's just a sickness. So demons can use sickness to attack believers, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the sickness itself is a demon. Next question. Let me look here. Can you comment on the movie Come Out in Jesus' Name? Well, my friend Pastor Vlad's in it, and I got my mm. friend Isaiah, and then I just uh, actually just spoke with uh, Daniel. Daniel, Daniel just, and I just spoke on the phone. Great men of God. I pray God uses it to deliver many people. I haven't seen it, um, but I pray God uses it, and many are touched in the name of Jesus. And by the way, some might be saying, well, don't you guys disagree? Well, not really. I mean, we teach on it differently. Yes, we disagree, but like, I say, get the person set free, and we could debate about whether they were saved in the first place or not later. Um, That's, it's really, um, it's important, it is still an important doctrine, um, but I'm saying that I don't, I don't disconnect from people just for disagreements. Now, if someone, if someone came to me and said, Jesus isn't God, I'd say, okay, you're a false teacher, I want nothing to do with you. Um, But, you know, we all, we all have different ideas um, based upon our best interpretation of Scripture. But again, I'm just showing you, again, and this isn't coming from someone with no experience. Some people say, well, David, you didn't count. Guys, I saw demons' faces, face to face. I heard their voices. My great-great-grandfather was a powerful warlock, very famous in the region. I I actually spoke with demonic beings face to face. I was tormented since a child. My, My grandma was able to move things around with her mind. Okay, I come from a line of witches and warlocks. I'm not proud of that. On top of that, I had many supernatural encounters as a kid. And I practiced deliverance ministry exactly the way I'm telling you not to. I previously did this for several years. So it wasn't that I didn't go deeper. 
It's that I didn't go deep enough. And in going deeper, I finally realized, oh my goodness, I've been doing this from the religious point of view. And again, I know when I say these things, it stirs the nest, but so be it. I have to tell you. And the reason I'm so adamant about it is because this doctrine that Christians can be demonized leads to horrible, horrible um, rabbit holes. People just go down the spiral. They live in the constant fear of losing their salvation. They live in constant torment. They see demons and everything. They, and by the way, they even isolate from other Christians saying, you don't believe Christians can be demonized? I'm going to stay away from you. They see demons in their loved ones, supposedly. It gets really ugly. And especially for those with mental illness, this can cause a lot of problems. So I see that doctrine. Uh, I love deliverance ministry. I practice it. I love exorcism. I love um, spiritual warfare teachings. Again, it's the third most covered topic on my channel. But this doctrine that Christians can be demonized, it is a lie. It is a very dangerous lie, and it heavily affects Christians in a very negative way and keeps them in perpetual deception. And again, I say this as someone who loves deliverance ministry. And so if you're looking for a channel, you say, you know, I love deliverance, I love exorcism, I love spiritual warfare, but, but I want a balanced approach. You found your channel. Uh, welcome to the Spirit Family. Make sure you subscribe. Um, let me see here. Looking now, how do you find the root of anxiety? Great question. We got to find the lie that's ultimately producing it. Uh, just being honest with you, for me, the lie was that I wasn't loved by God. I genuinely believe that. In fact, the Holy Spirit asked me, and it broke me. I remember tears streaming down my face. The Holy Spirit said, why don't you believe that I love you and that I plan to do good things in your life? Oh. I tell you, even as I sit here, I can feel the power behind those words. It, uh, tears were just streaming down my face, and I realized that for my entire life, I genuinely believed that God was just angry with me, and, and it was a major, major breaking point. Um, looking back at some of the questions now, uh, hello, pastor, what do you believe is the reason for having to pray and fast for certain demons? Well, Jesus told us in the text, uh, after coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he stumbled upon his disciples trying to expel a demon from a boy, and it wasn't working. And so he said, he said, you faithless people. Jesus was just not having it with them. So he rebuked them for not having enough faith. So when you fast and pray, it's an increase in faith. And it's only by faith, watch this now, that we access divine authority. And therefore, that's why he told us to fast and pray. Um, let me continue to read. These questions are coming. Okay, I got it to slow down now, finally. Um, I'm continuing to read here. Steve, did you see any good questions? Yeah, I just was speaking on Facebook over here. Uh, this question came from uh, Jeremy. Jeremy wrote, uh, what about doubting what God is showing you or not wanting to believe what he has shown you because it's not in your favor? Say that again. Uh, yeah, Jeremy wrote, what about believing, what about doubting what God is showing you or not wanting to believe what he shows you because it's not in your favor? I mean, uh, you got to believe what God says no matter what it is. That's important. Um, there are some things God will tell us, and we may not like it, but we have to, we have to adhere to it. That's why he, he's, he's the Lord, we're the servants. Um, continue to read here. Lots of great questions coming up, but they're coming up so fast that I... Oh, this is a good one. How do I make friends I have no social skills? Now, believe it or not, this has a lot to do with the torment of the mind. Because someone who is tormented in the mind, um, let's just call it, I know I was very weird, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. And so as someone who's battling with a mental illness and maybe even some degree of social anxiety, uh, what this actually creates is a hesitation to connect with people. And that hesitation creates tension. So people can feel your tension. People can feel your awkwardness, if you will. I'm not, and I'm not saying that so that it gets in your head and you're like, oh man, you're telling me they can feel my awkwardness. No. Uh, but that social anxiety can prevent you from connecting with people. But you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone and do it anyway. Now, in your journey to find friends, you will encounter people who make fun of you. You'll find people who don't understand you. Thank God I found people, I found really good friends, that even though they may not completely understand me, they accept me and I am who I am and that, that's it. My beautiful wife, Jessica, uh, she married me, so thank God for that. Uh, and she's, she's, she, she doesn't always understand me, but she accepts me. And she, she you know, there's, there's a, I still have a few quirks in my personality. I'm just very different, okay? I'm a different person. 
Um, and sometimes that expressed itself in the ministry. Like, for example, with this whole teaching, nobody knows what category to put me in. The cessationists don't like me because I practice deliverance. And then, uh, you know, the old school traditionalists don't like me because I don't follow the rules. So it's like, well, I guess I'll just carve my own way. Uh, we people who are of the Spirit, we're very unique, you know, uh, you included, Spirit family. Um, then I got, you know, I have, I have Ruben Vargas. I have, of course, Steve Moctezuma, Patrick Jankowski, my brother. There's Isaiah Lopez. You know, there, there's Tim Lay. I, got, I have friends who, who truly, truly, uh, Jeremy Marquez, friends who truly understand me and they know my quirks. And, and that took years to develop. I had to, I had to reach out. I had to put myself in the positions to, to create friends. And so you'll find that even if you just get around people who will tell you, hey, man, you're being a little weird, you'll find that that's actually going to help calm the mind. Hmm. So I'm continuing now to look for questions. Let me see. Uh, sometimes I hear a voice that calls me or say something when I'm sleeping. Is that demonic? It could be, yes. Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. Demons will attack you. Demons will speak to you. Demons will torment you. Demons will accuse you. As a born-again believer, that can happen. And you will need deliverance from torment, from anxiety, from strongholds, from deception, from temptation. You will need deliverance. So please, don't go saying, David doesn't believe in deliverance. I do. More so than most, I believe it. And I've seen it more so than most. Not because of me, because it's God's ministry. And I've watched as the Holy Spirit has done it. I'm not taking credit for that. That's His work. I've watched as He's done it. I've had the privilege of having a front row seat on this channel, in ministry events, to watch hundreds and thousands of people set free. And so I'm saying that, you know, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's important that we give him the credit for that. Uh, but, you know, that could be demonic, yes. But I'm telling you that, that that is done from the outside. They can attack you from the outside. And so we mustn't confuse this with habitation or attachment, you know, where there's the, you know, what is your name? Oh, my name is it. Christians should not be doing that. I'm telling you like it is, guys. Mm. Take it or leave it. Wow. Um, I know it's not popular. Well, actually, it probably is more the, the widely held view, but I, I understand that, you know, there are some misconceptions around here uh, on the, the channel, and that's why you're here. You're, you're learning. Um, let me see. Looking. Steve, anything yet? Yeah, I have another question from uh, our friends over on Facebook. This one comes from Myra. Myra writes, do you believe that the so-called demonized people are just looking for a little bit of attention? Not I've all. I've seen a few manifestations yeah. in person. I hear it. And it just seems so extra. Um, not always. You got to realize deliverance, I should, I should specify. I should specify the, and I think we get the terms mixed up. We got to understand that deliverance is a reference, a general reference. There goes my microphone. Deliverance is a general reference to people being set free, okay? Exorcism is a very specific kind of deliverance. And so people kind of interchange the terms. You've got to watch for that. Um, because, you know, like I'll agree with the statement Christians need deliverance. I agree with that. I disagree with the statement Christians need exorcism. Very different. Exorcism is a very specific type of deliverance. So when you say, are, are they faking it? Is it acting? Sometimes it is, but most of the time I would say it's not. Most of the times, it's a Christian actually being delivered. Now, if the demon's talking through them, okay, that's exorcism, and that's not a true believer, or it's not true exorcism. That's Bible, guys. I'm giving you Bible. Hmm. Now, if you're talking deliverance, you know deliverance can be emotional. I've seen people shake when they're getting delivered. I've seen people yell when they're getting their white because there's like a release of something in their emotions, in their mind. They're just they're so overjoyed at what's happening. People respond to the power of God. I've seen people who aren't being delivered scream when the power of God comes on them because it's just that intense. You have to realize the power of God is intense. Um, so, so sometimes it's a very strong emotional response and emotion is not bad. We've got to get that out of our minds that just because I'm saying it's emotional, that it's bad. You can have a genuine encounter with God where you're being delivered and have an emotional response to it. That's okay. And that sometimes is a little exaggerated and sometimes it's genuine. But talking now specifically, turning away from just ordinary, you know, generic deliverance where it can get emotional, where there can be physical responses. I want to talk about exorcism, where you see the people talking for the demon, um, you know, like, like the demon trying to hit the preacher through them. You know, that, again, either it's a truly demonically possessed person or it's a Christian. And because of the terminology, you'll hear people say, well, well so you don't believe Christians need deliverance. No, I don't believe Christians can be possessed in that regard. 
And so in that very specific instance, you've got to watch for the terms and watch even how um, we in the body of Christ use it interchangeably, deliverance, exorcism, deliverance, exorcism. Uh, when you say deliverance ministry, that covers more than just exorcism. So specifically speaking about exorcism, yes, there are some who are acting. In fact, I watched a video the other day about a guy, I don't know why it came up on my feed, about a guy who said that he, he admitted, he got on camera, he said, I went to a deliverance, and he didn't say the name, thank God, I don't believe in you know, attacking brothers and sisters in Christ. He, he, he said, I'm not going to say the name, but I went there, and I felt pressured to act a certain way, so I manifested, uh, supposedly, and when they asked me what my name was, I just made something up, I thought what, what they wanted to hear. Now, that's not the case with everybody, but it does happen. In fact, anyone in deliverance ministry will tell you that that happens sometimes. Um, but specifically in regards to that exaggeration, sometimes that's there too. Yes, people do exaggerate and people do act. And this is why whenever I'm casting a demon out, I make it clear, I'm not going to spend 20 minutes with you. Now, some might hear that and say, oh, Brother David, you would leave them in bondage? Well, no, because I understand what the Scripture says, that if it doesn't come out instantly, me screaming at it is not what causes it to go. Demons aren't afraid of my yelling or my techniques. So I'm going to do what Jesus said. I'm going to go and fast and pray. I'm going to come back and do it again. And if it doesn't go then then we can deduce, biblically speaking, that it's probably a mental illness or an emotional problem. Um, so no, it's not leaving people in bondage, but I'll tell them, look, I'm, I'm just going to pray over you, and the Holy Spirit's going to do it. And the reason I say that is so that eliminates any possibility of anyone just trying to come and, you know, roll around the floor for half an hour. And many times that's what, what happens. They want to come, and they want to manifest, and they want to show. Not always, so don't hear what I'm not saying, but yes, it does happen, but not all of it is show. I've we had someone manifest here recently, and, you know, that was, okay. yeah, let's cast it out of you. The demon tries to talk, be quiet and go. I don't, want, I don't want to hear your lies. Well, Brother David, you can get intel. They're liars. Well, Brother David, you have the authority to make them tell the truth. Well, there's circular reasoning. If I have the authority to make them tell the truth, then I have the authority to make them leave right away. What's the point in getting the intel? Never necessary. Um, all I need to know is in the Scripture. Hmm. Let me see. Um, looking for more questions. I think we might be just out of them. Um, looking here. How long would you fast for? I don't, I don't talk about my prayer life and fasting. I just, it's something I just don't feel right. And my friend Chris Garcia in the chat says, exactly. God bless you, my friend. Mm -hmm. um, how do you walk in the Spirit? Obey the Word. Um, don't, don't worry about filling the space here, Steve, because I might just jump right on a question. You Unless can. you have a really good one. Uh, this one has been brought up a couple times. Okay. Uh, this one's over on uh, YouTube. This one was from our friend Financial Freedom. They write, why is the term ungodly soul ties so popular and accepted among Christians today? I don't know. I don't know why we've embraced <laughs> that. Um, they're referring, um, let, me, let me show you the scripture here so I don't butcher it. This is speaking about being joined to a prostitute. Um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, right here. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 16. I don't want to use Amplified. Let me go here. Let me go 1 Corinthians 6. Let me just pull it up on mine. I know this dead space isn't good for the stream, but I'll leave you in suspense. I'm going to show you the verse where soul ties comes from. Now, if someone wants to use the term soul ties, I'm not going to go saying, you know, like... I'm not going to cause a big fuss over it, but um, the moment you start embracing terms like that, then you start embracing methodologies. And again, this comes down to if Christians can't be demonized or cursed or have soul ties or be generationally cursed, you just took out a whole chunk of a subculture. You didn't remove Jesus' deliverance ministry, by the way, because Jesus' deliverance ministry doesn't just cover exorcism. Jesus delivers the believer, hear me now, from deception, temptation, torment, accusation, and sometimes addiction. He delivers the unbeliever from possession. And you may have a question about delivering unbelievers, but let me show you this anyway. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 16. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? So in context here, what's the Bible talking about? Your physical bodies. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? Well, look at what it says there. It says nothing about the soul. That's the one verse. So this is talking about the physical act of sex. It's not talking about a tether. 
That's what a soul tie in the new age is. You know, you got these different chakra points that they say, and, and people say they're delivered from the new age, and then they bring their new age into um, in ministry. Some of you need deliverance from your deliverance doctrine. Hmm. Um, and so there's like this, this tether right now between me and this person. And so now it's not enough that I've repented. It's not enough that the power of the Holy Spirit's in me. It's not enough that I walk in the Spirit. Now I need to do all those things. Plus, I have to do a special ritual that may or may not work. And if it doesn't work the first time, I have to keep doing it. Tell me if that's biblical, guys. Come on. I know some of you don't like this. And I know that uh, this is tough for some to hear, but I'm giving you Bible. And again, this is coming from someone who practices deliverance ministry, practices exorcism. And I'm not attacking deliverance. I love the Holy Spirit's deliverance ministry. It's why I defend it so vehemently. But guys, and preachers, my friends, if you're watching, guys, we can do this without all these extra crazy things. And it's not, it's not just the fact that it's, I love crazy and weird if it's of the Holy Spirit. The problem is it's damaging. It's damaging. That's my plea to preachers, those of you in who specialize in these ministries. I'm pleading to you. Please, let's correct these things. You can co just tell the people to get saved after they get a demon cast out of them. It's that simple. And then that fixes both problems. Now, Christians who are born again aren't living in the constant torment of wondering where their salvation is or even, ex even you know, exacerbating those mental illnesses that some might have. Now we come into the truth and Christians walk in their identity, their peace, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, while also acknowledging we should practice exorcism. Um, Steve, got anything? Yeah, this one comes from our friend Henry over on Facebook. Henry wants to know, this question is in regards to the unsaved in my life. Is it safe to say that there are negative, uh, that their negative actions heavily demonic in nature? Are their negative actions heavily demonic in nature? Um, I'm sure they are, but I don't, I don't necessarily know that that would affect you unless they're doing something directly to you. Um, so I, 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 forgive me, I don't completely understand the question. Uh, Katerina says, are generational curses real? Um, maybe that might apply to an unbeliever. I have a whole teaching on this, by the way. Uh, Britton, if we can get that title, I would like to get that. I've done a whole thorough teaching. I think I went like 45 minutes to an hour, just taking you through the scripture, showing you the first curse all the way to the New Testament curses. And we comb through the Bible and I show you what curses are, what curses are not. And ultimately, the conclusion is that Christians can't be cursed. You say, well, how does it work then sometimes? I cover all that in that teaching. Let me know if we have that yet, guys. Um, I, it's break the generational curse, and curses in quotations, once and for all. <laughs> break the generational curse once and for all. And guys, again, you might say, but Brother David, demons do attack believers. Or how do you explain alcoholism coming through the generations? Because demons attack us generationally. But when you use the word curse, it implies that you're powerless unless you find some mystery. Look, God does not hide your freedom behind some demonic ancient mystery. God does not say, well, I'll free you once you find your ancestor who did this. You repent for their sin, even though I said I wouldn't hold people accountable for other people's sins. You repent for their sin. And then if you've done it effectively, maybe I'll do it. Well, all of us would have to go all the way up to Adam and Eve if that's true. And again, that comes from the new age, from the occult, but that's not biblically solid. So yes, they can attack you generationally. They strategize against you generationally. But those strategies and attacks only work if you take the same action. So I call it generational consequence instead of generational curse. Um, so here we go. If there's no generational curses, then why are there babies born with deadly diseases and suffer? Because there's sickness in our world. Well, when Jesus went to go heal the man who was born with his ailment, the disciples asked, who sinned? He said, nobody sinned. He's, he's, uh, this is so that, that God might be glorified. So if you're going to say that, that sickness or babies born with disease is the result of a generational curse, you can say that's a genetic curse, and that has to do with physical results. But I know of believers, born-again believers, who suffer with genetic deformities. Are you going to tell me that they're cursed and not blessed? I'd rather believe what God says. God says mm -hmm. we're blessed. The question really comes down to whose words are powerful enough to say cursed, 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 when God says blessed, blessed, blessed. God says blessed, someone else says cursed, Whose words are going to win? You tell me. Can demons cause nightmares? Yes, because those are projections of thought. Those are a form of deception. 
Let me go here. <laughs> your, your bondage breaker book is out soon. Yes, and in the book, I cover all this. In fact, I have a whole chapter on all of this stuff we talk about. I didn't talk about generational curses because it's already over 300 pages long, hmm. and I'm going to probably do a separate book uh, for generational curses. Um, looking now, Steve, anything you got? This uh, question comes from our friend Sonia from Facebook. Sonia says, how do demons enter children at such an early age? Well, if they're unbelievers, it, the Bible's very clear. Demons can enter children. It's just one of the realities of the fallen world. It's sad. Um, sometimes, and again, this has to do with the generational attack. I'm talking about generational curses on believers. So now we're talking about unbelievers and their children having demons enter them. You know, that's just the reality of the fallen world. The Bible's very clear that demons can possess children. And I've seen it myself. And it's, it's quite an ugly thing to see. Um, but it's... It's something that can be remedied through the power of the Holy Ghost. What about insomnia? Um, insomnia is a problem typically of the flesh agitated by demonic beings. Um, I think I'm going to read this because this will come up when people say, well, if exorcism isn't for believers, who is it for? Well, it's for the unbelievers. You say, Brother David, aren't we supposed to not cast demons out of the unbelievers? Well, that's all Jesus ever cast demons out of. Think about the apostle when the, woman, the, the psychic woman is following him around. Man of God, man of God. And he turns, cast the demon out of her. He wasn't a Christian, yet he drove it out of her. Jesus drove demons out of Mary Magdalene, and then she followed him. Okay, well, wait a minute. Some will say, well, I thought she had demons after she followed Jesus. No, a lot of people misread that resurrection narrative. In that resurrection narrative, it was referring to her as someone who had demons, but it wasn't saying she currently at that time had demons. It was just to differentiate her from the other Mary. So, no. Mary did not have demons while following Jesus. So Jesus casts the demons out of her, and then she follows him. The, the demoniac, the man with legion of demons in him, Jesus cast the demons out of him, and what was his response to that? He wanted to follow him. So this misconception comes from Matthew chapter 12, where the Bible says, well, Jesus says in verse 43, when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest but finding none. So here we see that demons grow very tired outside of a physical body. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home, empty, swept, and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter that person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this generation. Well, first of all, we need to cast demons out of the unbeliever because they're not promised tomorrow. No one is guaranteed tomorrow. Second of all, I thought we're called to set the captives free. I mean, we do things like God all the time. I can't think of how, I mean, sometimes we as the people of God can, can live in such hypocrisy. Set the captives free, set the captives free, stop being religious. That's the stuff we say, right? Right? We say, set the captives free, stop being religious. But wait a minute. Why do you point your finger in the unbeliever's face and say, sorry, I can't cast your demon out for my doctrine tells me so. That's some bad doctrine. Third, it would leave the person in torment. Fourth, do you know that the Bible says that those who know the truth and wander from the truth, that it's better for them to have never known the truth than to have known it and then wander? Well, then if that's the scripture that we believe, shouldn't we say, well, don't witness to them because once they know the truth, they could end up worse, spiritually speaking. No. We don't say don't witness to them because they could end up worse because they have known the truth. So why on earth do we say don't cast demons out of them because they could end up worse? I, mean, I can't think of anything like that more religious. I'm sorry, the textbook tradition says I can't do it. That's religion. That's legalism. These weird doctrines we come up with. And, and, and Jesus doesn't say don't cast it out. He's saying here's the state of that person. And by the way, that person was empty. That's not describing the believer. And the person's empty because they weren't born again. So what's the solution? The solution isn't I'm not going to cast your demons out. The solution is I'm going to cast your demons out. And fifth, it's God's goodness that leads a man to repentance. So I've seen, biblically speaking, and in everyday life, experience that's consistent with the word is good, that when you cast the devil out of someone, they want Jesus. What a profound experience that they were born again after having been delivered. That's important. Some might say, well, why not just get them saved, and then you don't have to cast the demons out of them? Well, that fails to take into consideration the fact that some people won't be saved because of the torment that they're in and they're bitter at God, or they won't be saved because of the deception that they're under, or they won't be saved because they're too tormented to be around people who speak the gospel in the first place. We gotta stop with these religious 
ideas that prevent people from being free. And so people say, well, who do we cast demons out of? Exactly, the unbeliever. That's, you see how the scripture, if you follow it, leads you to the right conclusion. Either exorcism is for the unbeliever or it's for nobody. We complain all the time. Stop leaving ministry of Jesus undone. Stop neglecting deliverance ministry. Yet we neglect the unbeliever. By the way, and I think this is the nail in the coffin on that one. It was for me anyway. Think about the, the inconsistency of saying that we shouldn't drive demons out of unbelievers because it can come, down, come back seven times worse. Yet those who believe that Christians can be demonized will say, oh, cast it out of them. Well, wait a minute. If you believe Christians can be demonized, why would you cast it out of Christians too since demons can come back sevenfold? Wouldn't the same apply? We say, well, the Holy Spirit protects them. Oh, I get it. Okay, so the Holy Spirit protects us against seven demons but not one. These are the kinds of silly inconsistencies that you end up with when you follow religious dogma. You have to follow the Holy Spirit's leading. So this text, again, is nowhere near saying that we shouldn't cast demons out of unbelievers, not even close. Wow. Steve, what do we got? Our friend Tiff writes, can psychosis be demonic? Yes, psychosis can be demonic. It also can be natural and agitated and prolonged by demonic beings. Um, why did you change your name from Encounter TV to David Hernandez? Because YouTube is becoming more of a social media account and there's more interaction and I wanted it to be more personal. When is your book coming out? In June. It's called Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker. It's coming out in, in Spanish as well. Okay, guys, I think that'll about do it for the Q&A. A couple of quick announcements for you. Um, speaking of deliverance and the power of the Holy Ghost, let's get on this now here. We're coming to Orlando, Florida. That's going to be May 26th, Saturday, and, or Friday and Saturday, excuse me. Friday and Saturday, May, May 26th and 27th. Orlando, Florida. We're going to be there. Make sure you go to the website, davidhernandezministries.com slash events. Register, please, 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 please register so we know how many seats we get. We always run out of seats. We don't want to do that. So by you registering, you're letting us know, I plan to come, and that helps us to accommodate seating. And because we don't charge, it's hard to tell how many people are actually showing up. So please register. It's very helpful. Again, Friday and Saturday, May 26th, 27th, these will be nights of healing, deliverance, worship, the Word, Come and experience the presence and power of the Holy Spirit like never before. I know it'll be a wonderful time. One final thought, or promotion here, if you will. Um, we are just about, let me see if actually Tim, if Isabella let me know here. Um, I didn't get the exact number yet, but she will uh, let me know here uh, later on. Uh, the internship, we have a lot of applications, guys. And I want you to apply if you want to be a part of our internship. I'm looking for Gen Z. Don't be offended if you're not in Gen Z. We actually are looking for mentors too, so everyone can be involved. Now, contact our ministry. We have applications for mentors. If you want to be a mentor to help us reach Gen Z, you can help be a part of the internship program. Excuse me. If you're Gen Z, I want to, I want to reach you because your generation is the most unreached generation in the United States of America and really in the world. So this internship program is for those of you who are in Gen Z, you're already committed to the Lord, you want to go into ministry, and you're ready to go to the next level. I want to train you. I want to mentor you personally. I want to disciple you personally. So does Steve. So does our staff. I want you to get involved. You can apply for our internship program by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash intern. Go and apply. Send in the application. Look, apply, and we'll figure you. You say, well, I might ha not have enough for tuition. Look, Trust me when I say, just apply, and let's see what the Lord does, okay? So apply. I'm, I want people who are serious now, young men and young women, and also more experienced men and more experienced women, like my age demographic and up, are also welcome uh, because we have spots open for mentors who will come alongside as like a big brother figure or a big sister figure or a mom or a dad figure. Like I know, Britain, your mom is a mentor. So Britt May's mom signed up to be a mentor, and as soon as I heard her name, I was like, that's going to be perfect. So she'll be a very motherly mentor, and it's going to be great. So Pam, we're, looking, we're very much looking forward to having you part of the internship program. So this is not just for Gen Z. It's to help Gen Z, but we also have mentorship positions open so that you can help us reach them. There's applications for that too. Go and apply now. We're running out of space. Steve, my voice is exhausted. Please close got it. the live stream. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this stream. It was a powerful one. 
And all, as always, guys, remember, nothing is impossible with God. We'll see you next time.